Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome those of you who are here together with us in the conference room. It's great to see all your smiling faces and all of those of you who are joining us online. This is the 16th year of this wonderful partnership with Vanderbilt Law School. Helping to build the next generation of environmental lawyers and policy professionals is a priority for ELI and partnerships like this one, um, especially with the expertise that, that we have at the Vanderbilt Law School is a, a critical part of that. We're delighted to welcome the third year Vanderbilt Law students <clears throat> who selected and will introduce the articles we're gonna to discuss today. I would love to thank Linda Bregan and Mike Vanderberg Van Vandenberg for establishing and leading this effort. It's, it's such an important contribution. Uh, I especially wanna thank Tori Rickman um, and Bella Blanco for, who helped her out um, for coordinating all of the details and threads of this conference. As you know, we're all still adjusting to, to being back in person and hybrid events have so many more details. So just especially wanna shout out to, to Tori. Um, we also wanna thank Jay Austin, Rachel John baptiste and Bill Straub for producing the publication. At ELI every year, we look forward to the August issue of our Environmental Law Reporter News and Analysis because that's the issue that we call the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review, LPAR. <laughs> It's such a service to be able to learn about creative new ideas in the academic literature, um, especially critical um, re related to critical current issues um, without having to read long, detailed, heavily footnoted law review articles. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to okay. Linda and Mike. I look forward to an interesting day, um, and I hope to see all of you at the reception at the end of the day. Great. Thank you Thank so you. much, Sandy. And welcome, everyone, and welcome to our webinar participants. Um, so excited. We have like over 450 people register for the webinar, which is just really exciting. Um, before we dive into the panels, we want to do a little background on Environmental Law Policy Annual Review. What is it we're trying to achieve? How did we get to the articles that we're going to discuss today? So I'm going to start by handing it over to Mike Vandenberg, my co-instructor for Environmental Law Policy Annual Review. Um, and let's talk about the goals of yeah, LPAR a little yeah. bit. Why did we form LPAR? Linda and I both served uh, in the Clinton administration, and we both were following the environmental law literature at the time. And yet every time we opened up uh, an environmental law review article to try to give us ideas about where to take policy, uh, either of two things happened. Either they were so dense and they had so many footnotes. And I love footnotes, by the way, but, uh, but they had so many nice. footnotes that they just it was just too dense to, in, in the kind of time you have in government. And many people in this room and online know that. The second feature that disturbed us was that when academics uh, need to open a can, they just imagine a can opener, right? But people in policy can't do that. We can't just assume away the feasibility of policy. So our goal here is to reward academics for actually including policy relevant recommendations and wrestling with feasibility of adoption in their work. And I found as a new academic after I left government and left private practice that I was being discouraged from engaging with the feasibility of policy options. The product of that is you get a lot of smart people all talking to each other isolated from the policy. Group. So the goal of this from a DC perspective is let's bring policy out of the academy into the policy world and let's improve the quality of theoretical and empirical academic scholarship by making it hold its feet to the fire when it comes to feasibility. Then the second piece you're going to see throughout the day today, a major goal of our journal is to help students get exposed to the process of understanding the literature, presenting it a day like this, et cetera. So you're going to see students playing a major role all through the day today. And that's an incredible goal, important goal of the LPAR process. So that's essentially what we're up to. Wonderful. And now you get to hear from those wonderful uh, law students. Um, Kyle Blazinski is going to tell us a little bit about our process. He's been our editor in chief and he has done a fantastic job. I've heard that spiel a million times, but I love hearing it every single time because it reminds me that what we're doing is actually impactful and it's, and that's just really is rewarding. Um, but as Professor Bregan said, my name is Kyle Blazinski. I'm a fourth year JD PhD student at Vanderbilt Law School. And I also had the privilege of serving as the editor in chief this year. I think I have to echo some of the earlier comments about thanks, because this really was a long, arduous process to get here. I want to say thanks first to our authors for going to be joining us throughout the day, and all the others that were selected for recognition in LPAR, for really heeding LPAR's call and grappling with the policy implications of their theoretical work. And so we're grateful to them. We're grateful, obviously, to our instructors, Professors Bregan and Vandenberg, and then also Professor Caroline Cox, who joined LPAR this year. She's an adjunct faculty at the law school and the director of the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program at Vanderbilt. 
for just the insights that they bring into the classroom every week when we're talking about articles. We're really grateful for their time and expertise. Troy Rickman, again, who not only helped organize this whole event, but has kept me and Professor Bregan sort of on track <laughs> over the last year. We're grateful to her. And then obviously Kerrigan English, who helped out a lot with the planning of this symposium and others. I'm Jay Austin, again, the editor-in-chief of the Environmental Law Reporter, everyone on our, on our advisory committee, and really three generations of Vanderbilt Law students who have worked for this single August publication of LPAR. We're grateful for all of their time, and I'm personally grateful for their ways that they challenged me to think differently about scholarship and environmental law in general. Um, so we're grateful to all those people, but like I said, it is really a long, arduous sort of process that begins with a pretty thorough review of really all the academic literature published in the last year in over 150 law journals. Um, and those include both general interest law reviews and environmental law journals specifically. And if, you're inter if you have any sort of familiarity with legal publishing, that might sound a little bit weird because we are a little bit different in that sense. We're not publishing new scholarship. We're finding scholarship that's already been published and trying to highlight the most impactful scholarship in a more condensed, readable sort of way. So if we sound weird, we are a little bit unique in that sense. Um, but like I said, with those 150 journals, then we then move on to a Boolean search and Westlaw for any article that talks about the environment, which as you might imagine is pretty broad. Um, but we sift through that, we kick out articles that don't talk about the natural environment. So you'll get a lot of pieces that talk about maybe a hostile work environment. We kick those out and focus on the natural environment. Even then within that subset, it's not enough to just talk about the environment though. Um, so we look for articles that meet two threshold criteria kind of informed by those policy goals that Professor Vandenberg had mentioned previously. We start with really two kind of threshold questions. The first being, does the article specifically address an issue that is of major importance to environmental quality? And then our second threshold question is, does the article <laughs> offer a law or policy relevant proposal or approach that has the potential to influence the policy process over the short or long term? So again, those are informed by some of our goals about actually being having some sort of policy impact. So any article that meets those two threshold criteria then get evaluated across four dimensions by two student editors. Those four dimensions being persuasiveness, impact, creativity, and feasibility. And like Professor Vandenberg said, I think we really probably kind of put a thumb on the scale for this last two, creativity and feasibility, which are, I think, really probably the most important two in terms of actually executing on policy goals. And articles that receive high marks from those two student editors across those four dimensions then get brought to the full LPAR staff, so roughly 20 students every week. We sit down and we talk about those articles that got high marks, and then we ultimately Kind of based on conversations amongst ourselves and with our faculty advisors, talk about which articles we think deserve recognition, and that becomes what is called LPAR's top 20 articles. So like I said, this is an arduous process, and it is more of an art than a science, so I think it's really important to bring a lot of voices into that conversation. So once we have um, our top 20 articles, we then meet with an expert advisory committee, which includes a whole host of experts from NGOs and law firms, um, a general the general counsel for a major environmental advocacy organization is going to join us later today, chief sustainability officer for a Fortune 100 company, top litigators at major law firms, so really people across the legal spectrum that come in and talk to us about which of the articles within the top 20 they think are most deserving of recognition at events like this conference in DC and through other venues. So with their input, we pick, like I said, we pick LPAR's award winners. We highlight those in the LPAR issue of the Environmental Law Report every August but also in different ways. So you might see every once in a while, we have an LPAR podcast that comes out through ELI platforms. We publish blogs. We have a second conference that Kerrigan was also instrumental in planning in Nashville every year. Hopefully maybe we'll see some of your smiling faces there in the spring of 2025. But after that sort of long arduous process, we get to celebrate those articles at events like today. So we're grateful for the last really 15 months of work across three generations and we're excited for the discussions to come. Well, Kyle, thank you so much. And I counted uh, arduous four times. And uh, I think what he meant to say was arduous and fascinating. And fulfilling uh, and rewarding. And really yeah, yeah. Uh, I got more adjectives. Don't worry. Don't worry. But, but that, understand how hard it's been. So, uh, no. You know better than 16 years. I only had one small part of that. So, trust me. I love it. I'm a total nerd. I just think how wonderful to just read law review articles written by brilliant people. And I, I, I it is arduous, but it's also fascinating. So, Claire Thompson is our development editor. She's going to give us a little snapshot of um, what did we, what did we read this year? What, what topics did we read about? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Thompson. I'm a third year law student at Vanderbilt University Law School, and I'm the development editor of the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review this year. 
Um, and as development editor, I keep track of trends in environmental law scholarship. So this morning, I'd like to review just the results of our data analysis for the 2022-2023 cycle. And these trends are actually going to appear in our August 2024 edition of ELR. So be on the lookout when that comes out. We have an established methodology for evaluating articles and collecting data. And if you're interested in a more detailed look at the process, the full information on our methodology can be found at the website using this link and QR code. Um, this details the methodology used last cycle. Changes in the methodology are minor from year to year, um, and we will um, have the newest methodology out soon. This year, we analyzed 301 environmental law articles for the August 2022 through July 2023 um, school year. Um, and we pulled from Westlaw for these articles. When members read through an article to assess whether it's environmental or not, they consider a few different things. It could be hard to kind of categorize whether it's an environmental law article or not. Um, and it's definitely more of an art than a science. Um, but we look at whether environmental law and policy are a substantial focus of the article and whether environmental topics were given more than just incidental treatment and if they were integral to kind of the main point of the article. And of these 301 environmental law articles, 120 came from general law reviews and 181 came from environmental law journals. And so for our selection pool, where we're kind of pulling these from, we use the rankings compiled by the Washington and Lee University School of Law rankings. And they've got two different lists. We filter down to United States-based journals, and then we use their lists of uh, environmental and land use law journals, and then also their energy and natural resources law journals. And then for our general law review selection pool, um, we pull articles from the top 100 law schools on the US News and World Report. And we classify these articles actually into 10 topic categories. And these categories actually come from ELR's subject matter index. So they're kind of pre-laid out for us and we just kind of categorize them into these categories. Um, and they include air, climate change, energy, governance, land use, natural resources, toxic substances, waste, water, and wildlife. And articles can receive they all receive a primary topic, but sometimes they will kind of deal with more than one topic. And so they'll also get a secondary topic. And again, this is more of an art than a science. It can be kind of hard to determine if an article um, should go into climate change or energy, if it deals with both. We do our best and more than one student reviews each article. Um, the environmental articles published from August 22 um, to July 2023 included 132 governance articles. 32 climate change articles, 30 energy articles, 27 land use articles, 25 water articles, 14 natural resources articles, 13 wildlife, 13 toxic substances, 10 waste, and 5 air. And you can see them grouped by the percentages here. And some um, also have a subtopic. So governance is actually a very large um, kind of category and it includes 22 subtopics. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a short list we've kind of presented here of the ones that occurred most commonly, but also some that occurred only once. Um, and actually there's one bankruptcy there. Um, that one bankruptcy actually made our top 20 articles this year, kind of fun fact. Um, <laughs> The uh, private governance subtopic was introduced last year, and it remains very common with 21 articles. I think last year it had 25 under governance. Um, and then environmental justice was the most common subcategory under governance with 25 articles. And then some of our articles also had a secondary topic added. And so here's the kind of spread of secondary topics we had. Um, we saw governance leading again, uh, followed by climate change, which had a little bit of an increase up to 23%, um, land use, natural resources, followed by water, energy, air, and wildlife, and then finally, waste and toxic substances. And then this next slide, this kind of represents um, our top 20 articles. Uh, we also analyzed the data within the list of top 20, and this is just all of a short review of the um, titles here, um, we also review the data inside of our top 20 choices. Um, and this cycle, 16 of our top 20 were from environmental law journals and four were from general law reviews. And then within this top 20, so we even get even further down, 
Um, we had a range of primary topics with the most common being climate change um, and then also governance, governance having all of those sub subcategories underneath that. And then um, in our secondary topics, we had governance leading again, and then we had two natural resources kind of subcategories. Um, and then not all of the articles had a secondary topic. As you can see, uh, there were a few that were just that one big primary topic. Slide. And then, oh, there we go. Yeah, here's the data. Um, and then uh, next slide in our top 20, we kind of siphoned it down into kind of like big ideas. Um, we had seven articles that proposed that federal agencies promulgate new or updated regulations. Two articles proposed private environmental law solutions. Four proposed updates to federal laws. Three proposed changes in the judicial system or um, called for a new interpretation of existing law. Four articles proposed state or local policy approaches and three proposed broad paradigm shifts. And these actually overlap. This number adds up to more than 20. And that's because a few <laughs> articles dealt with kind of more than one main um, topic area. And um, that's everything. Um, please look out for a summary of these statistics appearing in our August 2024 issue of ELR. We had a great pool of articles to choose from this year, and we are really excited to discuss some of them. And with that, I'll hand it back. Great. Thank you both. Great job. And we um, post the top 20 on the website, so you can access that. And this year, for the first time, we're also going to post by some categories. So we're going to um, post a list of all the environmental justice articles and all the private governance articles, because we figured that that might be really helpful to practitioners and policymakers who are interested in a specific topic. You can skim down that list. You can click to the article if you're interested. So thank you so much. I'm going to do some logistics here and invite the panel up. Um, and the panel has a special door back here uh, because we're a little tight on space. So hopefully, thank you guys. Um, hopefully um, they can sort of come on in as I'm going over um, some logistics here. And we've done a lot of thank yous already, but I really do want to thank and welcome the 3L students from LPAR who are here. You all have been an amazing group to work with. I'm already feeling sad about the end of the semester. And hopefully we have a bunch of 2Ls that are on the webinar and and um, they are watching this from the journal office and eating pastries and drinking coffee. Um, I want to thank Maggie Milam at Vanderbilt, who handles all LPAR things with a plum. We really appreciate her. And I have to thank Tori again. And Colin Gibson Tansel is our webinar expert, and he's going to be with us all day online. So here's the deal. I am going to try to move us along as smoothly as possible today. And we have a process for each panel, which is going to be our student editor is going to introduce the panel. We're going to hear from the author or co-authors for about 15 minutes. Then we're going to hear from each commenter. We are going to give the authors a chance to respond to what they've heard. And then um, we will have the um, uh, law student kick off the the Q&A, and then I'll be um, moderating the Q&A in the room, and I'll be trying to take um, questions as well from the um, webinar participants. And um, please feel free to just come and go. Uh, we don't take long breaks because we don't want our webinar participants to be lonely um, mm -hmm. while we're on break. So, you know, just as I say, come and go. Um, there's coffee, there's pastries, please eat them. We do not want food waste from this event. We'll have box lunches later. And as Sandy said, we really hope you'll stay for the reception around 2.15, 2.30 today. Um, if you have questions during the day, I think Tori is back there. I know Kerrigan, if you'll raise your hand, um, we'll be happy to help you. If you have any technical problems, webinar participants, just put, um, put that in the chat and our webinar tech team will help you. If you have questions, webinar participants, please put them not in the chat, but in the question and answer box. And I'm going to get to as many of them as I can. The recording from today and all of the slides all of the slides will be posted on the website. As Kyle mentioned, we also do blog posts and we do podcasts, and those are also available on our website. And um, Kyle and I actually recently did a podcast with Cass Sunstein and Kit Viscusi about Cass's article on the social cost of carbon. So you may want to listen to that. Um, and I think I've done all the logistics, and I'm really excited for today. And I'm going to hand it over to Michael Fernari to introduce our panel. Thank you, Professor Bregan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michael Fanari. I'm an articles editor at LPAR and a 3L at Vanderbilt Law School. 
I'm honored to introduce the author and panelists for our first discussion on Felix Mormon's Climate Choice Architecture, which was first published in the Boston College Law Review. Felix Mormon is a professor of law at Texas A&M University Law School and an associate professor of engineering, technology, and industrial distribution at Texas A&M's College of Engineering. Professor Mormon is an expert in energy and environmental law, and his scholarship focuses on the energy transition. He received his JD and JSD at the University of Passau School of Law and an LLM from the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Dr. Lisa Dilling is Associate Chief Scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. Prior to joining EDF, Dr. Dilling was a professor in the Department of Environmental Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder for 19 years. She has also held past positions at NCAR and NOAA's Office of Global Programs, and her research focuses on climate resilience and the energy transition. She received her BA from Harvard College and her PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Anjali Narang is a visit visiting graduate researcher at Cornell University, where she is also currently completing her PhD in applied economics. She studies consumer decision-making relevant to environmental and food policy. Anjali is also currently a data scientist at the US Office of Evaluation Sciences, where she supports impact evaluation of government programs and behaviorally based changes of those programs. She received a master's of science in applied economics and management from Cornell University and a bachelor of science in international relations from Tufts University. And Jolly speaks today in her personal capacity only and not as a representative of the US Office of Evaluation Sciences. <laughs> Tabitha Scott is Executive Sustainability Officer at Kilbane. Tabitha is a futurist and innovator with over 20 years of executive leadership in global Fortune 500 sized organizations. She represented the built sector for the development of the Presidential Climate Action Plan during the GW Bush administration and served on the Executive Office Roundtable for Climate under the Obama administration. Tabitha has a bachelor's degree in finance from the University of Louisville, a master's degree in bank management from the Graduate School of Retail Bank Management at the University of Virginia, and an MBA from Fairfield University. Tabitha is also the author of the soon to be best selling book. As an author of a book myself, I know how important it is for people to get well, care about we're it. We're going to have to hold up Power of Change. Uh, she's just released her book, and uh, it's really thoughtful. I just finished it. So. And lastly, Dr. Ruben Sussman is the director of the Behavior, Health, and Human Dimension Dimensions Program at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Dr. Sussman conducts research on energy efficiency behavior change and co-chairs the annual conference on behavior, energy, and climate change. Reuven is an adjunct professor and member of the Faculty of Graduate Studies at the University of Victoria. Dr. Sussman earned a Doctor of Science in Social and Environmental Psychology from the University of Victoria. And with that, I'll give it back to Professor Bracken to start today's panel. Over to our author. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a huge privilege to be here today and to get to speak to all of you in person and those of us, you joining us online. I, I want to extend my thanks first and foremost to the Alpar staff um, for choosing this article. It's a huge honor. Um, it's a great way to, to promote, you know, the kinds of ideas that we ruminate over for, for so many hours, days, weeks, months in our ivory tower and to help spread the word. So this is a wonderful platform and I couldn't be more thrilled to be here. I also want to extend my thanks to the Environmental Law Institute, of course, for hosting us and for everyone involved. Especially, though, I want to thank Michael and the other student editors who have done yeoman's work turning this awfully long and heavily footnoted article <laughs> into something hopefully more digestible and less off-putting. So, again, my sincere thanks, and to the extent that even the digestible version was a little overwhelming, maybe this talk can make it even more accessible. Anyway, climate choice architecture. So, you know, before I really start talking about climate choice architecture or climate nudges, which you know I really, in the article and today, will use both those terms largely synonymously. I want to you know honor one of the all-time greats in this field. Uh, last week, Danny Kahneman passed away at the age of 90. Um, he is one of the pioneering researchers in this space. Um, pretty much all of my work and the work of many of today's researchers in this space builds on his research. So I hope you'll join me in just a short reflection in honor of that. Day. Thank you. And, you know, with that, let me talk a little bit about the project background here. So this particular project was really inspired by, you know, three key factors. The first, and I don't think this audience needs much persuasion on that account, is the urgency for us to take action to respond to the climate crisis. Um, we have no time to lose. 
And that not just means we need to take action in the here and now, it also means we need to explore every possible avenue to move the needle. And interestingly, public policy in this space has historically focused primarily on institutional actors, ignoring the large contributions and potential for you know, really making a difference at the individual levels. And so if you think of mitigation and adaptation efforts, a lot of policymaking really targets industrial actors, firms, et cetera, but much less at the household at the individual level. Now, of course, Professor Vandenberg's work here keeps ringing the bell on this subject and keeps trying to persuade policymakers <laughs> to consider the individual contributions as well. And I think this article tries to do much of the same. Um, so that's the, the second motivating factor. The third, of course, is that you know, policymakers, a lot of economists tend to treat us, tend to treat citizens as rational actors. This is the old homo economicus view of the world. And we know, or we should know better by now, thanks to work done by Danny Kahneman and many others, we're not as rational as we'd probably like to be. And that can both be a disadvantage, but it can also be a perk. It can be a bug or a feature. And in this article, I try to explore this as a feature, as a point of intervention, as an access point that can give policymakers greater leverage and hopefully help their policies succeed more. With that said, this article and really the surrounding work as part of the legal research stream seeks to make three contributions. So the first is I'm hoping to offer here a uh, functionally derived taxonomy of choice architecture to help us better understand what it entails, what it does not entail, and you know where these different avenues can add value, but really to to offer a little more granularity than they've often the place, also in criticisms of choice architecture. Next, and this is of course at the heart of the piece, I'm making the conceptual and to some extent empirically grounded case for greater reliance on choice architecture, on nudges in the context of climate change. Finally, the article you know, wouldn't be complete if I didn't at least engage with some of the most prevalent criticisms leveled against the use of nudges for policymaking purposes within and beyond climate change. So let's look at these one at a time. I already mentioned that I'll be using the terms choice architecture nudges largely it's not actually today, but first I wanna take a step back so we can all appreciate what choice architecture is all about. The power of any choice architect, and by the way, we are all choice architects, make no mistake. <laughs> right. The power of any choice architect really flows from the realization that human preferences are malleable. I touched on our lack of rationality. <clears throat> you know, that means a lot of what we choose, what we decide, depends on context, depends on the choice environment, in other words. How we're presented with different choice options, with different possibilities to make a decision, heavily impacts the outcome, heavily impacts what we ultimately decide to do. And that means that subtle changes to this choice environment, or nudges, if you will, can result in different choices, different decisions. Now, with this decision-centric view, I classify three different types of choice architecture. The first is decision information, followed by decision structure, and lastly, decision assistance. What do they each mean? Well, decision information really seeks to help us better process, well, first of all, identify and then process relevant decision information. As Herbert Simon told us many, many years ago, we live in an increasingly information cluttered world. Keep in mind, he said this in the 1960s. There was no Twitter, there was no social media. Imagine how much more cluttered our environment has become in the meantime. So in that world, attention has become an increasingly scarce resource. So how we allocate, how we deploy our attention is hugely important to our decision making. This is where informational, educational choice architecture can help a great deal. Help decision makers identify and focus on the information that matters, that matters to them. Also makes that information more accessible, easier to digest. An example of this is the constantly evolving data and depiction of fuel economy metrics 
on the Monroney label. Those window stickers that if you're considering a new car purchase, you'll be looking at. How do you translate these numbers, the MPG numbers, for example, into your family's bottom line? What do they mean for how much it'll cost to operate this vehicle? What it means for your commute costs, et cetera. This is a great way to hopefully help that decision include these important metrics, important for climate change, for energy conservation, and many other aspects. On the decision structure, we've seen the importance of how a decision is presented. Whether or not a list features certain aspects at the top or at the bottom affects how likely you are to choose a given option. But perhaps the most prevalent of these is, of course, the default question. Which is the option you're going to go with if you don't make a choice, as opposed to if you make an active choice that diverges from that default option. Here, one of the salient examples is organ donations. Some jurisdictions have a default opt-in. By default, in other words, when you get your driver's license or register your vehicle, you are an organ donor. Only if you say otherwise, you will not be considered an organ. Other jurisdictions say you have to actively opt-in. And of course, the participation rates vary dramatically based on this decision structure. Lastly, decision assistance. Even if we'd made the perfect quote unquote decision, we considered all the relevant information, we make sure that the decision structure does not sway us any which way. The question becomes, are we going to stick with our decision? Do we have what it takes to follow through? You know, think of this as the New Year's resolution version of choice architecture. <laughs> choice architects can help with that as well. How do they do that? Well, think of one prominent example, the birth control pill. As it turns out, only 21 tablets have an active ingredient, yet there's always 28 in the package. Why? Because we don't want to break this pattern of compliance. The idea here is if you continue to remind yourself that every day you have to take a pill, whether it does anything to your body or not, it's going to help with compliance. And drug compliance is a huge topic in terms of social benefit, but also social costs. So then let me talk about why choice architects have so much to contribute to climate policy. The article gives a whole list of arguments and factors. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on just a subset today, but of course I'm happy to engage with others during the Q&A. One that should really give us a lot of faith and you know, encourages greater reliance on nudges or choice architecture in the climate context is a proven track record. These types of interventions have shown that they can work. They can make a big difference, move the needle. And we've seen this across a variety of subject areas. If you think about it, in Queensland, Australia, social norm-based campaigns that appeal to a sense of community, to a sense of joint purpose, shared identity, have made a huge difference for water conservation purposes. We've seen very simple tweaks to the choice environment have a similar impact when it comes to waste reduction. Waste reduction, for example, related to food. Whether hotels at their buffets for breakfast and other meals offer you a plate this size or this size has a huge dramatic impact on how much food gets thrown up. Because of course the eyes are always greater than your stomach and your appetite, but if you can only pass so much on that plate and you have to make more trips to the buffet, great. You're going to be more efficient, maybe smart on your decision making. And of course, we've seen a lot of policies that give us cause for hope in the context of energy efficiency and clean energy. I'm sure Dr. Sussman will talk more about this, but default structures, for example, for an opt-in versus an opt-out in the context of green energy plants have made a sizable difference. And yet, to date, we're underutilizing these tools in the broader climate change context. So again, that's where the article says, let's do more of this. And let's make it easier for people, institutional or individual actors to make climate friendly choices. Another argument the article makes, of course, has to do with carbon pricing. Now, when I first researched and wrote this article, I, I thought carbon pricing would be a done deal by the time I went to print. <laughs> Yet again, I was wrong, and I should have been <laughs> smarter, this, smarter than that because you know I've been thinking that for probably 10 plus years. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, even if it doesn't happen just yet, it's not at the national scale, it's happening elsewhere. And it's also happening at the subnational scale, as we all know. And here's another domain where choice architects can really add value. How? 
well, across the entire life cycle, if you will, of carbon price. They can help reduce and overcome barriers to implementation in the first place. Because a lot of you know, hesitation has to do with the perception of these policies. And public perception can often be based on biases, heuristics, in other words, cognitive shortcuts, or some would call them shortcomings. This is where choice architects can help counterweigh, counterbalance these pathologies. And then post-adoption, post-implementation, these policies can really help with implementing with the efficacy of the policy. In other words, to the extent that we're concerned with resource shuffling and leakage, as we've seen in, say, the California programs and elsewhere too, this is where a behaviorally informed intervention can pick up some of the slack, if you will, and thus extend the overall coverage. Another example I want to give, because I think in today's political climate, and hey, we're in DC for a reason, it's ever more important. Choice architecture, nudges, can help give us a bridge over the partisan chasm of climate politics. We all know that the divide over climate change is real <clears throat> and it's substantial. Whether you believe or don't in climate change, whether you deny the reality of climate change, of course matters to your view of politics and policies. But as it turns out, political scientists have posited, and with good arguments in my view, that a lot of this comes down to differing views of the appropriate role of government. Whether you favor big government versus small government, whether you are into a market-based, laissez-faire kind of economy, or whether you want more government oversight, these actually track neatly with attitudes toward reality of climate change and what type of response we need to provide. And so fortunately for us, there's some common ground here because overwhelmingly, both parties approve of behaviorally informed policies in the context of nudges. Think calorie labels, think tobacco warnings on cigarette packaging. These have widespread bipartisan approval. Let's harness that kind of dynamic to get greater buy-in and thus greater implementation for these policies. Now, I promised I'd engage with some of the criticisms as well, and they're significant. And I don't want to sweep them under the rug. There are those who are concerned that these nudge policies are overly paternalistic, that we don't want anybody, let alone a policymaker, to tell us what to do, not even when we use the bathroom. Hey, Lex, you, you know we're in an environmental conference when there's a picture of a toilet on the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I was hesitant whether or not to use it. We have to talk about waste at some point. Right? Yes, exactly. We have to talk about waste. And of course, we should be talking about soccer. This is my European heritage. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, these installations were hugely successful at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. I will not go into any detail how success was measured. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so the one response to this paternalism critique is, A, yes, it can be real. So I don't want to dismiss it out of hand, but it applies with different force depending on the type of choice architecture we're talking about. Remember the three part taxonomy I offered you, but to the, to, to the extent it's informational, decision information, all you're doing is making it easier to make up your own mind. That's not very paternalistic, now, is it? Decision structure, if it's the fault, yes, there's an element of paternalism involved, but one replete to that is of course that Choice architecture predates any of this research. Long before Danny Kahneman was born, long before Cass Sunstein started writing on this area, Richard Thaler, Philip Benarchi, whatever you want to name, long before that, choice architecture existed. Anytime someone's giving you a choice, how they present it, they're being a choice architect. So we might as well accept that reality and try to have it work for what we believe in as a good cause. Now, Another critique relates to the efficacy. And here I want to just quickly switch gears and tell you a little bit about a related research stream where we wanted to get to the bottom of this. So we ran an experiment, survey experiment online, and we gave our subjects two scenarios. We asked them across both scenarios to invest in an inheritance worth $5,000. And then we gave them a choice of three stocks that were presented either like this in the control condition. So typical data that you see on E-Trade, your Charles Schwab account, et cetera. It was either presented like this, and of course here you would choose the A-Corp stock based on its strongest historical performance, or in the control and the treatment condition, it was presented like this. So we included a climate rating. 
All of this harkens back to the ongoing conversation about climate disclosure. You're familiar with the SEC efforts in this space, of course, international efforts for other financial regulators, the same. And so the question is, that's all very complex and not easy to digest information. Our experiment here sought to test what ways we could use to present that information and whether it would matter to investors, retail investors, individuals, in other words. Well, guess what? Our findings suggest it matters a big deal. Here's what we see. Now, you can tell here that the control condition in red, out of $5,000, participants invested about $1,400 in the stock that we have identified as most climate friendly. Note here that would be B Corp, and it's not the most economically appealing stock. Well, depending on how we frame this climate rating, you see how that investment amount can go up by over 50% all the way to $2,243. Almost half of that inheritance now goes to a stock that based on performance alone, you might not choose. And I like this slide because it also tells us the nuance here. So we try different framings and this is ongoing research. And so we're doing more of it, but it tells you that these contextual choice architectural elements matter. They have an impact. And so to the extent that we A, use them and B, get them right, it'll help the efficacy. Now, I'm almost out of time, so I just want to give a few shout outs here. One is to the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, whose research grant funded some of the empirical work I just showed you. I also want to give a shout out to my co author in life and on this empirical <laughs> study. And of course, I want to thank everybody again for being here and for giving me the floor. Thank you. And of course, I look forward to the comments of this esteemed panel and your questions. Wonderful. We're going to hold. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, th thank you so much. And I want to just remind the um, webinar participants to put your questions in the Q&A box. And Lisa, we're going to hand it over to you. Super. Well, I'll, I'll just add my thanks. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you to all the students who put together this amazing effort at a, to select the article and then invite all of us and to make this, this meeting happen. I really appreciate um, being here and uh, you inviting me. So um, I just wanted to say how much I, first of all, enjoyed reading uh, this article by Professor Mormon, and I think it provides a comprehensive framework and a really masterful summary of the state of knowledge on behavioral nudges as they're applied to environmental outcomes. If you haven't read it, I mean, I'm sure all of you have because you're good students and good, good, uh, <laughs> good academic types here. Um, it really does uh, do a great job of summarizing literature. It also crosses over from energy into water as well. Like we learn a lot from water use is another area. Um, just an excellent uh, summary overall. And I really support his conclusion that uh, nudges can be really powerful instruments for achieving climate goals. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before, I'm going to kind of offer a few comments here, um, but before I wanted to sort of set out the scale of the challenge again that we're dealing with here, I think you, you Professor Mormon has really put this forward in his article as well. But one of the reasons we want to focus on nudges or any anything to do with climate choice architecture is simply because of the scale of the challenge we have. I know that we know this and we, we read about it, talk about climate change as an issue, and we are seeing, in fact, we have signs of hope. We have uh, record sales of EVs. We have record um, growth of renewables being put onto the grid and so forth. We have new commitments to reduce leakage from methane. Um, so there's some really signs of hope. But at the same time, our emissions continue to go up. We have hundreds of millions of people living without access to electricity at all in the world. So this means that we are going to have an increasing demand for energy. And unfortunately, fossil fuels still provides 80% of our energy. So again, the scale of the challenge is really huge. Um, and as we've added types of energy in the past, from say coal to oil to natural gas, those have been additive. So in other words, we've continued to increase our use of energy. Um, over time, it, it hasn't been as much that we phased away any of these sources of energy. We just kind of added to them as we as our use of energy has expanded. So really, um, focusing in on the demand side, how much energy we're using, it's a actually really inexpensive way to um, to deal with this increasing need for energy. Because if you we we do need to provide some energy to parts of the world that don't have currently energy now, and uh, it, it increases our quality of life so much. Um, but if, if we can reduce the demand a little bit, even a little bit, it just means we have to let, 
build many fewer renewable energy uh, generation uh, plants or, or put in less transmission lines, those kinds of things. So this is worth focusing on. I just want to make that point. It sounds like it might be a, oh, it's just kind of a nice thing to do. No, it really makes economic sense, actually, to reduce the demand side. Okay, going off my script here. <laughs> um, I also wanted to just say, um, because in case you haven't read the book or uh, you know, Thaler and Sunstein uh, nudge, I wanted to kind of distinguish really quickly what we mean by a nudge, because I, you mentioned that a little bit, but it's not, there's lots of ways to kind of steer climate choices um, and not all of them are nudges. So here's how Cassin or, or how Thaler and Sunstein um, define this. Any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people behavior, people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. So those kinds of choice architecture pieces are not nudges. There are other kinds of things we can do. To count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. In other words, it doesn't force you to do anything. It just mm -hmm. kind of nudges you, you know. <laughs> um, nudges are not mandates. So for example, putting fruit at eye level counts as a nudge. Banning junk food does not. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of distinguish what we're talking about on the panel in terms of a nudge. Um, okay, so we'll go on from there. So I wanted to just offer three points um, in response to this excellent article and close on a suggestion uh, for future work. Um, the first point I wanted to highlight and that Professor Mormon really lays out in great detail in the article uh, is the complex way that nudges play out in real life. So we have, you know, we have research examples, we have how we think it might work in theory, um, and then we have a lot of, of actual experiments in the real world or even policy implementations that we can look at. Um, and it just shows that there's a lot of complexity to nudges, and they have to do with both the way the nudges are designed and the, who we are as people receiving those nudges. So um, those two interact can interact in ways that are very unexpected and that we might not actually anticipate and might work not as we intended. Um, you know, the literature is replete with things like, you know, age, political affiliation, cultural background. You know, who we are as a person can really affect whether or not we respond to a nudge positively or whether we actually not only reject it, we, we kind of act the opposite direction that we're trying to be nudged. Um, so it, I think that one thing, this is something I work on in other areas of climate, but it's really important for those researching in this space to be working, I think, with practitioners of policy together, like trying to design policies for nudges together with the research community and um, practitioners, because they can both learn from each other in terms of what, what practically could work, but what do our theories say, and what does our policy experience actually say? And, and those communities can help accelerate where we get to on nudges if we work together. Um, secondly, I wanted to pick up on the theme uh, that Professor Mormon mentioned about climate change being at its most politicized right now. Um, this is a really important point and a really important issue, I think, for nudges, even though you know, we might imagine nudges are kind of in the background, fruit at eye level, that doesn't sound very very, you know, that sounds kind of innocuous, right? To put the fruit at eye level. But as we know in our society, people find out quickly that we're, we're trying to do nudges or we're, you know, that that's an, a deliberate choice. Um, and and, and I, I'm not sure I buy the idea that even though the idea of nudge policies in general for smoking and so forth um, are, are nonpartisan, you know, that both parties uh, support that, climate change is polarized enough that it might actually work the other direction. It might, if you start to nudge people, it, the polarization that's there in climate change might actually come back and, and, and become uh, a polarized situation for the nudge deployment. So, so I'm not sure, I think that would need to be tested. It's basically a hypothesis, I think, that, that you, know, you can bring over the nonpartisan state of nudge policy and apply it to climate change and it will help us there. It might actually, unfortunately, still get, part of, still get uh, polarized um, there. Uh, let's see. The other thing I, I really picked up on from the article was this idea that one of the critiques has been that nudges are often seen as paternalistic, you know, that they're sort of, we have other words for that in the States, in the U.S. here, you know, like big brother or, or the nanny state, maybe that's in England, I, you know, different, different countries have different words for this. It that's, doesn't always go over well, at least in the United States, you know, the, the idea of the, of anything that's seen as paternalistic. And that, that um, makes me think, that it's really important, and I know there has been some research on this, but I feel like this could be a good focus for the future. Um, the need to rigorously test which nudge policies have the most chance of success across individuals with a range of political viewpoints. Um, 
And again, we could say, well, maybe we don't care half the population isn't going to be the target anyway or something. I don't believe that. I think if you're going to try to change your demand for energy, you need to be thinking about how your nudges work across the spectrum of, of political viewpoints. And this is just a hunch. I don't know the, the cases, but many studies that we do in, in, you know, in the lab type of thing, they're done on college campuses with undergraduates in the laboratory. Uh, or maybe even as natural experiments where a city is already kind of predisposed to caring about climate change and they're looking for what might work, right? Those aren't necessarily the case of, of uh, those aren't necessarily the environments where we might need to be deploying nudges out in quote, the real world. So again, diversifying the cultural context and situations where we're using nudges would give a fuller picture of their potential. Um, Third point that Professor Mormon acknowledges really well is that the evidence for effectiveness of nudges is mixed um, and they've been criticized as a technique. One, one, one area I really wanted to bring out that I feel is uh, needs, needs more exploration and, and more rigor to figure out like where we can actually use these is this idea of information provision. Um, Professor Mormon mentioned like uh, labels for miles per gallon, you know, for how well a car, how, how efficient a car is. There's a lot of work on information labels and unfortunately, the news is sometimes they're pretty confusing. Um, they can lead consumers to uh, different conclusions than you intend by the label. Um, there's different ways though, the good news is there's, there's ways to produce labels and put labels on things that actually are super informative. Things like the seal of approval, you know, Energy Star is a good example. Like putting all the energy details of that washer, people don't always know, you know, how to interpret that. Even salespeople don't know how to interpret that. But, um, but, but an energy star label is pretty clear. You know, this one has a good energy star rating. Okay, so that's just to say, you know, there, there, there are some areas I would say that, imp that information piece is, is possibly, no, it wouldn't be, it would be something we'd have to focus on a lot more, I think, to be more effective. So I, I know my time's on, up here. I wanted to end with a few suggestions um, to help accelerate the design and, and, and uh, implementation of these nudges. One thing I like to argue for is a community of practice around this area. Communities of practice are basically uh, communities who are uh, of people who are engaged in trying to do this, whether it's in the policy sphere, well, mostly in the policy sphere, you know, on the ground. Um, they exist in, in the one I'm familiar with is the, the WUCA, the Water Utilities Climate Alliance. It's a group of the largest water utilities in the United States. They're forward look at looking at how we manage water for climate change. Um, they sit together, they talk, what did you do? What did you do? Did it work? Did it not work? Um, that kind of exchange of actual experience is, is incredibly helpful and pushes the field forward. And researchers can engage in that community of practice as well. Conducting more systematic analyses where we can get the greatest bang for the buck in the nudge world, um, and then building in learning and adaptive design into our nudge policies as well, because we know, you know, as Professor Mormon pointed out, how much we don't, um, like the, they don't always play out the way we intended. But in summary, I, I really agree with Professor Mormon on the potential for nudges and suggest that we double down on this more systematic approach to creating effective strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really interesting. And you can just cue and okay. they'll they'll flip the slide. Yes, we, we lost the clicker. So um, you know that's my most important function for today's event was well, to try to run out to CVS to see if we could find a clicker, but we finally decided yeah. that wasn't even worth trying to do that. So we're gonna do yeah. it remotely. My friends are so fine. Okay. <laughs> Ah, see, the panel has solved the problem. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'll try to go to Tori as you <laughs> Oh, it's not sharing. Okay. Oh, but, um, yeah. We have your updated. Okay. I'll just do you then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, Professor Mormon's article, Climate Choice Architecture. Um, oh, sorry, you could go on to the next slide. <laughs> I think it might be on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, provides a very comprehensive survey of the potential role of nudges in the fight against climate change. Um, and I honestly don't have much to debate with this article. I agree that nudges are underutilized in climate change mitigation efforts. 
So I instead, I'm going to use my background in behavioral and environmental economics to add some additional insights on how to optimize nudging for climate change. Um, I want to start by motivating the use of nudging in this space with some statistics. Um, the IPCC in 2022 um, reported that behavioral change and sociocultural factors could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 5% rapidly. And the graphic below this um, has blue boxes that represent the sociocultural factors. Um, and it has, according to this graphic, the largest potential in the building sector, next in industry, and less so in land transport. Um, Despite this finding, um, nudge research continues to be underfunded. Only 0.12% of all research funding spent on the science of climate mitigation was awarded to the social sciences, um, instead being directed to the natural and technical sciences. And this is represented by the small band. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, the, the small band on the graph on the right. Um, and the larger band on top of that represents funding for the natural sciences. Uh, so my first recommendation from uh, the behavioral economics literature on how we might optimize nudge design is to first identify behavioral barriers and internalities relevant to the problem and population of interest. Um, and this term internalities is taken from the behavioral economics literature and refers to the cases in which individuals are not making choices in their uh, best interest. So in other words, their choices are not maximizing their own welfare. Um, then with this understanding of behavioral barriers, um, you might be able to target different nudges to different populations based on which barriers they might differentially face as um, uh, Ms. Dilling also talked about. Um, and if I was to apply this recommendation to the issue of political divide on climate change, I might first uh, start by noting that the Pew Research uh, Center found that um, science knowledge was more predictive of uh, uh, Democrats having beliefs that uh, climate change is anthropogenic, but not Republicans. Uh, this might suggest that a behavior barrier for them um, for climate action is the lack of scientific knowledge, and they in turn might be more receptive to uh, scientific communication. Uh, Republicans, on the other hand, might be on average more averse to government intervention, um, so they might be more receptive to framing interventions that use neutral labels for policies that avoid references to um, explicit intervention. Uh, for example, one study found that uh, people were more accepting of the terms fee and offset instead of taxes, even though they might be referring to the same price change. And it's also worth noting that this might be true for some Democrats as well. Um, one way to increase the effectiveness of uh, targeting nudges is to individually personalize them. Uh, this quote here says that one size fits all solutions provide very weak generalizations because human decision making is not uh, homogenous or predictable um, in a rational or irrational way. Um, one example of a personalized nudge you might be already familiar with that was successful in conserving energy is uh, Oak Power's um, customized home energy reports. Um, and I've taken a screenshot from that report on the slide below, but basically uh, what they did uh, with this uh, was to uh, provide social comparisons of a household's energy consumption with that of their neighbors. Um, on one hand, uh, personalization is more costly, but um, one innovative approach to dealing with this is to potentially allow individuals to uh, choose or self-select into their own nudge or policy. Um, and one study did do this successfully uh, with incentives for exercise in India. Um, and I think uh, with advancements in big data, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, we'll be able to both personalize nudges more um, and also be able to scale for, uh, personalized nudges. <laughs> My second recommendation from the environmental economics literature on how we might optimize nudging is to evaluate it jointly with other tools as part of an optimal environmental policy bundle and not in isolation. Um, and cost-benefit analysis is crucial for identifying which components in these bundles belong there. Um, climate policy strategies should holistically evaluate the relative costs and benefits of traditional tools 
like command and control mandates and market-based incentives along the, alongside those of nudges. Um, as we are probably familiar with, um, nudges are generally viewed as low cost and cost effective, but one aspect of nudge, uh, nudging that is often overlooked, I think, is the cost of nudge research and uh, testing. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that our, many studies have found that nudge impact is context specific, uh, which implies that uh, we need more research on nudging um, and also uh, iterative testing. On the bright side, the fact that nudging is compatible with small scale testing uh, means that piloting and replication of nudge interventions in different contexts before they're implemented on a mass scale might actually save costs in the long run. So policy experimentation is costly in the short run, but in the long run, it might be cost saving. Um, in this exercise of thinking about nudging uh, as part of an optimal climate policy mix, um, I'm gonna list out some scenarios when nudges might be desirable complements to traditional tools. Uh, the first is when uh, traditional instruments uh, don't uh, perfectly or imperfectly <laughs> mitigate internalities or negative environmental externalities. Um, the second is when people who pay less attention or underreact to price instruments like taxes and subsidies are more responsive to nudging than people who are fully attentive to them. The third is when consuming green goods can generate a warm glow or a feeling of pride that can facilitate longer term behavioral change in combination with your traditional Peruvian tax. And the fourth, um, as Professor Moran has also pointed out, uh, is when taxes aimed at internal internalizing environmental externalities are politically infeasible. So in conclusion, uh, my recommendations from uh, the behavioral and economics literature for optimizing nudging for climate change, including considering behavioral barriers, targeting and personalizing nudges, evaluating nudge costs and benefits um, as part of a, and yeah, uh, evaluating nudge costs and benefits as part of a comprehensive toolkit to mitigate climate change. I think these could uh, potentially help ensure that nudging is accepted on a wider scale and hopefully increase R&D for nudge research and facilitate action on this stuff. Thank you. Hi, I'm the oddball on the panel today, <laughs> not in academics, although I've worked with the academic community significantly in the UK, Australia, and here in the United States. And boy, what a difference it is to be in America. Um, so the companies that I've worked for in the past um, were based in Australia or the United Kingdom, where they've been paying carbon taxes for decades now. So there's also a true cost of energy there. People have been paying 10 bucks a gallon for their fuel for a very long time. And here in the States, we start sweating it. I think it's up close to $4. You know? <laughs> so our subsidies and our policies are wildly important to what we're doing today. And um, actually... Mike, one of your books, a prior book um, with another professor there at Vanderbilt, yes, Jonathan Gilligan, was critical in our thinking as a business organization and how to relate to people here in the United States because of the political polarity. Mm -hmm. And so when I was doing a climate presentation, at one point I was the one that Mr. Gore would send to the Republican audiences. Um, and this nudge process and reading your article um, Professor Mormon was so profound to me because it put all in one place this choice architecture of the things we have been trying and some of the same books we have been reading. The nudge was being used in the UK for a while um, actively, and it ended up, you know, being put aside, disassociated from the government. But I see business as kind of this sticky part in the middle. It's like the middle part of the ice cream sandwich where you have the academics that are doing these really cool things and they're out in space with theories and you know they see it before the rest of us by a couple of decades. And then you have the government that is kind of acting slowly and catching on along the way. And then you have businesses that have more freedom and nimbleness. And so we can try things as early adopters, we can pilot things and often we can get money from the government to do that. And so uh, this choice architecture that you so adeptly describe in this article 
is really important for us to use because we can create positive influence. And why is this topic important? Well, I'll give anybody in here or online a million dollars today. If you can think of one thing in your entire life that's not 100% dependent on the environmental health, just one. So this notion of a triple bottom line of things being equal with economics and society, like everything is about the environment, right? So this is a really important conversation and we need to be thinking of it more in concentric circles like Marine Hart put forth years and years ago than you know, equal parts. Now, what is action and behavior? It's movement. And in physics, if you want something to move, um, you have to know where it wants to go. And so one of the things that you really talked about is make sure that this is a shared benefit. Make sure everybody wins. And that's where we're breaking down in environmental activism in the United States is we're busy like rallying up with villains and, and victims. Mm -hmm. You know, you stole my childhood, mm -hmm. you fossil fuel industry, you know, you're taking away our lives, you're killing us. Well, you just alienated like hundreds of millions of people from the decision table. So being positive and thinking, how do people really move? How do they get into action? It's not with sticks. If you look at social psychology, sticks will make people freeze, right? The deer in the headlights, that's what happens. If you want people to move, you have to inspire them. It has to be something positive. And that was a great takeaway from your paper. So some of the ways that we have used these technologies, and I can only resonate from my own experience, and I hope that that will help resonate with you with ways you might be able to take these great ideas and and push them forward in with what you do. With decision information, boy, we learned some really hard lessons back in the early 2000s. We were doing privatized housing of about 40,000 military homes. And this is something that the US government does so that it can keep high quality of military housing. And we thought, well, we're gonna help everyone save energy. And we started giving them like most utilities do, lists of oh, 10, 20, saving tips, mm -hmm. the more the better, right? So we did this and we gave them more every month because it wasn't working. And um, it failed miserably. And we started reading about behavior science. And these people were in green homes, by the way, green certified homes. So what's going on? The behavior of the people in the homes did not match with what we expected it to. They were blowing up their DOE baseline type and just didn't fit. So we worked with Cornell actually, at uh, Fort Drum up in New York. And we decided, hey, let's just pick one thing at a time. Malcolm Gladwell's work is really good on this too. Just pick one thing. So it was lighting. And we did a behavior program around just lighting. We sent kids on, you know, um, scavenger hunts in the homes, find some lights, you know, in your house and, you know, get a, get a sticker or whatever, turn it off. But one thing at a time, we reduced energy 6% in those homes. And we're like, oh, we're on to something. We need to study more behavior science and more nudges. What, what is this stuff? So then he talked about decision structure in your book. And this is really like um, simplifying your choices by default. Now, we were working with military service members. And eventually, and across the two different companies that I worked with, we had about 120,000 homes. Of military service members, they were very keen, unlike a lot of the United States, on saving energy. Like they wanted to do it. They were motivated to do it. And so they said like, yeah, I'm all in, let's do it. But we would tell them about like, you have a smart thermostat, here's how to program it, go forth. And they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Like they just, they didn't do it. And so what we did is we changed our lease. We made the default where we will implement these energy you know, use the smart technology in your green homes, basically, um, at your approval, you know, as the default. Now, they could still opt out. And if anybody complained straight away, we would go turn it off. But our move-in process shifted from, here's your smart thermostat, here's how to program it to, I know you want to do this, <laughs> let me do it for you. And the technology reinforces it. And that was another important part about your article was, let's leverage tech to make things happen and keep it consistent. 
people want to make commitments, but we're distracted. Like goldfish has a longer attention span than humans <laughs> these days. So it's really important to remind people at just the right time, which is just the right nudge. Decision assistance was really important to us. And what that is, according to his definition, it prompts action through reminders. We are all so busy and so distracted today. Back in 2013, we leveraged AI with smart meter data and we took the data, teased apart. We think this is probably like taking showers in the morning based on its time and its signature. Or this might be when the kids get home and they're leaving the fridge open. You know, Whatever those signatures were, AI was our buddy because it figured out okay, what are these habits? Now, what are very specific cues we can send them? Again, they opted in to this program, um, but they chose which method. So they had a choice. Text me, call me, send me a Facebook message. However that was, it goes back to choice architecture and back to motion, right? You get an equal and opposite reaction if you surprise somebody with something. I don't have time, I don't have money. If you flow with where they want to go, we want to say, we don't want surprises at the end of the month. We don't want our bill to be too high. You know, you're reducing risk. You're helping them reinforce things. So we would send them a very relevant nudge, um, oftentimes within five to 10 minutes of the habit that we sensed from the smart meter data. It dropped energy consumption across 11 Navy communities in the U.S. by 15% zero retrofits. So it was only behavior change and it's over a period of time. And uh, I've cited these sources, if any of you are interested in learning more in the paper that I submitted, because I knew I would just get up here and talk. Oh, they and I a new book as well. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're, some of them are in there, some of them are in there. Powering change is about how all of the answers we need for our business crisis today come from nature, mm -hmm. all of them. So the laws of motion can be applied to behavior change. So diversity in nature can apply to our everything from our stock portfolios to you know reaching people where they are. And so it's it's very important to reach people where they are. One of the things that I loved about your book in the second part, you start talking about um, the critics. Is this ethical? You know, is this really something that we should be doing? Is it too paternalistic, as you said? And I would say is it ethical not to take action? Like how long are we going to wait in the United States to do something? Is it ethical to know that we can take positive change and get moving right this minute? I, I think it is, you know? I think the effectiveness increase that we see by nudging behavior in a positive direction and making sure that it's positive, that's so important. Otherwise people aren't gonna move if it's not. But it's absolutely ethical and it's sorely needed. We find ourselves in this epic, epic crisis and we are the pivot point right now. We can choose how we want to go forward from this point and nudges are a huge part of that. Whether it's organ donations, you know, mm -hmm. opting out instead of opting in. Think about everything you do in the business world and in the policy world. Freedom of choice, well, it's still there. You're just nudging it and making it easier for people to do. So in summary, I just wanna stress that this work is critically important and businesses are here to help you, to shake your hand and to help get it done, whatever we can do to help. I'm currently serving as executive sustainability officer with Gilbane, um, which is a, a large, construction company that built the Smithsonian Airspace and wow. Science Museum. Uh, for example, we do a lot of life science work and very technical work with universities as well. And what we're doing is trying to use this architecture, um, while we're not a government, but your government choice architecture, um, to default and also to help people feel like they belong. Regulations in the U.S. for green building, well, they're not catching up to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. And so we are stepping out. We've done four living buildings, 25 net zero buildings, 313 lead buildings. We don't have to do these things, but we want to set the default and let people opt out of motion sensors. Let them opt out of renewable energy. Let us be part of this solution 
at this time in history. Um, so make things relevant, keep them actionable. Just one thing is they're too distracted. People can't get into action. Like don't even think about it. One thing at a time and keep it positive. You're going to lose people. 8% of the population, we're going to have to talk about labels afterwards because it depends who's reading your labels. Mm -hmm. If it's stamped green in the South, they're not going to buy it on purpose. You need to read his. <laughs> we, live about in, we live in the South. Yes. So all of my policies are Southern approved. Um, <laughs> ah, uh, having okay. grown up there. Yes. So one thing at a time, keep it positive. And that's it. Thank you again one for problem. having me. Um, we're just going to do a little bit of things here, so I'm going to remind everyone on the webinar to please put your questions in the Q&A, and um, we're going to do an all-out complete search for the clicker on the break, um, but for right now, you're going to share screen so you can, so the problem is that everyone's gotten really fancy with their slides, and it's not just a click-click, it's like, you know, click and then it's like a um, in motion kind of thing and I don't even know what it's called but um that is why we're trying to now give control to the is that working with us just to share screen with the zoom okay. is that correct yeah yes yeah, in the it. zoom yeah, I got it but I have to yeah. share screen with the um while we're doing this one of the things yeah. that I keep thinking about is given all these opportunities and we've known about some of them for a long time you know mm. where is where are the major programs within the major environmental groups this is something Lisa Dillon and I have talked about uh, over time. Um, and, uh, you know, why do we see these as sort of one-off things as a White House group when Obama's in office, it gets disbanded? Why don't we see sort of sustained efforts toward, uh, I think of it as behavior wedge, we think of it as nudges, whatever we want to think of it as. Um, and I think maybe that's something we talk about in the Q&A, you yeah. know. We had one um, really straightforward question from um, a webinar participant that I can um, just throw out in the meantime, which is, is pricing itself considered a nudge? So I'm inclined to let uh, Ms. Dillon answer oh, this one well, because she yeah. talked about what a nudge is and what it's not. But at the outset, I, I think the price itself, I mean, remember, Sunstein and Thaler say a nudge should not impose or reduce any economic costs. So the pricing itself, no. But how the pricing is communicated, I mean, we heard already about whether mm -hmm. it's labeled as a tax, as a fee, as a charge, has huge impacts. And, you know, mm -hmm. even something as seemingly simplistic as color, right? I mean, should it be green or should it be red? I mean, there are studies about how stock profits are being presented, whether the, you know, the negatives, the losses are in red or black color has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So um, the price itself is not a nudge, but how it's communicated can factor into the choice or rejection. Thank you. And with that, we're going to hand it over to Ruben. And hopefully you can move your slides. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like it's working. So um, I just want to start by saying that um, I was had a hard, hard time planning for this because I agree with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wasn't sure if that's what I was supposed to do. So I just put on that my <laughs> I put my journal editor or uh, journal reviewer hat on and just like tried to nitpick. But overall, I want to communicate that I strongly agree with the ideas, the principles. In fact, so um, just a little bit of background on myself. I have a PhD in social and environmental psychology. So I studied psychology for years. Uh, I apply this work at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE, where we do research and write reports on energy efficiency. We try to get those reports in the hands of like policymakers, businesses, industries that can do things with them to make the world a more efficient place. So I'm on kind of the front lines of trying to change policy and programs. And so I'm kind of speaking from my experience here and um, just uh, gonna bring up a bunch of things that kind of just I'm a curmudgeon about when it comes to behavior change. Um, so basically, yes, choice architecture, as defined by Professor Mormon, is helpful and important. I just want to say it's also easy to overestimate its impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can just conclude with like, so where do we stand on this? So number one, yes, choice architecture works. Labeling shifts behavior. I myself have done a number of studies on energy efficiency labels on rentals and, and real estate, and it does affect behavior, which is great. Feedback does reduce energy consumption. There's a considerable amount of work on this. Physical changes in the environment work. You know, if you put your recycling bin next to the garbage can, it works better than if it's further away. Mm -hmm. um, making social norms salient affects action, as we know. Um, and I agree strongly with a few 
I'm just going to call out a bunch of points, but a lot of the paper. Um, it's effective because we don't impinge on people's freedom. This has been mentioned a few times. We need more field experiments. Yes, like most of the research, uh, as mentioned earlier, has been done on small samples in the lab, in universities, and we need to see if it actually works in real life. For example, the labeling work on, on cars, although it's been done in the lab and it makes sense, I'd like to see it in practice. Do people actually change their, their vehicle purchase decisions? Uh, we need more, uh, and it's not coercive. I, I totally agree with this point, especially because it's already in place all over the you know, in our real world and daily lives. And so we're simply acknowledging it, bringing it out and changing it. Okay, um, so uh, the, the thing that I just kind of get on my uh, soapbox about sometimes is that I've done social psychology research for like a while now. And the book Nudge did a great job of packaging that for a non-social psychology audience. Uh, and this paper does the same thing. It's really, I kind of have trouble with it because I love that it's taken on this like popularity and everybody knows about it, but I think it's narrowed it and it makes it feel like it's the tool, it's the solution, you know, it's the thing. Uh, and I, I'm also a musician, so I like this analogy. Like when you start playing the drums, which I, I play, uh, you know, you're getting used to your, you know, different elements and you're just learning and it's really exciting. And then as you get better, you know, you have a drumstick and everything seems like a drum and you want to add more and more drums and cymbals and things you can hit and it's great. But then as a real professional, and this is what happens, you know, the next level, which we need to get to, um, is you simplify. You take your drum set down and no real professional drummer is going to take this giant okay, <laughs> Uh, and you recognize you're an element of the band and your piece is a piece of the puzzle, but not the whole puzzle. And I just want to mention this because, you know, people reading this get really excited typically, and then they think we need to do this for everything. And it's also just a minor thing, but like, I think in the paper, Cass Sunstein is a little overstated. Uh, he wrote the book Nudge, but he didn't do a lot of the work. You know, he's packaging a lot of this work that I think, um, more credit needs to be given to the, the original authors. Uh, we also need to get you to Nashville. I didn't realize you were a musician. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah. Strangers of Click. You can look it up. C-L-I-Q-U-E. We're up for a Whammy Award. Best Funk Band. Best Funk Song. For wow. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That's what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> the promo. Uh, yeah, we're on Spotify. You can look us up right now. Um, <laughs> Okay, and also just so like on this topic, choice architecture is not everything. Um, my definition actually of choice architecture is a little different. It's kind of framing a decision at the point of decision making. Um, so, you know, presenting a list in a specific way, <clears throat> excuse me, like the decoy effect, um, putting things as defaults, those are cho choice architecture. I don't usually think of things like commitment before a choice as being choice architecture. I don't usually think of text reminders as being part of choice architecture. Um, sometimes social norms are, you know, if they're presented at the time that you're making a decision. Sometimes feedback is if it's presented at the choice, optimal choice uh, opportunity. But I don't typically put them in the choice architecture bucket. And this is, again, just part of my curmudgeonness because I'm like, okay, nudge is great, but like there's all this research out there. And they're all different things. We should talk about them all individually. Um, but this is just me nitpicking. Um, okay, these approaches are important, but can be overstated. You know, I learned about this actually in doing the work preparing for this. Uh, default organ donation is not always as effective as we make it out to be. Uh, I don't want to get into too many details here, but also social norms approach, approaches are effective, but they have typically a relatively small impact, the ones that we're talking about here. Um, and there's tons of other psychology-based approaches and understandings that are important. Basically, you know, reward and punishment. I mean, obviously, Milgram's been talking about this, you know, made us aware. And laws and financial incentives are a huge lever, possibly the most important lever. So, you know, we're talking about something that's very important we should be considering, but let's not forget that these other things are also important. Just note for the record that a psychologist has just said that law matters. <laughs> <laughs> I may be a first in modern Try to history. make myself popular here. Uh, so, uh, you know, and this is you're coming from a guy who's argued uh, for behavioral approaches being important for years. My, my entire career is based on this. So I just want to acknowledge that that said, rewards and punishment matter. Habits. This is like most of our most impactful behavior is habitual and we need to change people's habits. That's not talked about nudges so much. Uh, emotions, emotion, decision-making is emotional and not rational. And it's also kind of neglected a little bit. 
And then organizational decision making is critical. You know, um, Professor um, Mormon does make a great point. You know that J.P. Morgan and BlackRock uh, made important decisions on ESG recently, and we need to understand those decisions. That's not about nudging. That's about social psychology and the internal social processes within an organization. Group polarization, groupthink, these kinds of other social psychology perspectives are really critical. Um, all right. Uh, I also want to say that it's not always about government policy. Again, this is me nitpicking. It's still important, but uh, many of the examples that were cited by Mormon, like saving water through social norms, reducing consumption with smaller plates, those are really about what I would call programs. You know, we're not passing laws about these. Uh, you know, the people in legislatures are not talking about those. It's the folks at a business that are like, let's use smaller plates. Uh, they're making an internal decision and that's why these things get passed more frequently than, or get done more often. Um, and some policies are not choice architecture, but classical economics, we just talked about cost. And I think you, I'm not, I don't wanna uh, uh, mischaracterize your paper. You mentioned cap and trade and carbon tax. Those are more classic economic things. And I know you're talking about how we can augment them with, with choice architecture, but I just wanna clarify for everybody, those are pretty classic economics, they work because you're changing what is fundamentally economic um, ideas. Uh, and some uh, nudges, so-called nudges, do require policy change. Uh, you know, changing default energy provider or having a mandatory label, those are very effective, but they do require some sort of bipartisan agreement and it's hard to get them. You know, that's why we don't see a carbon label on a lot of things. And, um, there's a lot of labels that are typical to pass. So harder to implement, but effective. Um, okay, and, and lastly, I, I think I'm kind of repeating um, what um, Lisa Dilling mentioned earlier. They're not really as benign as, as you might think. Um, you know, doc, uh, Professor, Dr. Uh, Mormon uh, mentioned, you know, that Republicans and Democrats don't disagree on nudges and that even the most fervent nudge, and cr uh, nudge critics would therefore struggle to find faults. Um, and I think that that's true for the uh, examples provided because they're about non-controversial issues or less controversial issues, calorie labels, tobacco warnings, saving for retirement. But if it, I think that if this became known as a threat, uh, there would be opposition to it. Right now it's under the radar. Um, if it came not under the radar, on the radar, I guess is the term, <laughs> uh, then there would be opposition. I mean, I'm Canadian and... Um, I'm completely baffled by like the strategy of winning elections by voter disenfranchisement. Like I thought that it's just <laughs> obvious. Everybody should want everybody to vote. Like that's not, who would disagree with that? But it's actually, you know, gerrymandering is a strategy. Um, and so I think that it's a little naive to think that if this was actually something that was so effective, it was really moving the needle. I, I mean, at this point, I think it's not, it's underfunded and we need to do more of it. So it's not quite there, but when it becomes there, we will see some backlash and we need to be prepared for that. And just a uh, note that traditional approaches are therefore still important. You know, laws and mandates and in, in incentives are strong levers, you know, maybe the most important levers. Uh, commercial and industrial sectors also matter. You know, they're big, um, they're big greenhouse gas emitters and, you know, things like, um, what's the term? Um, when you decouple, like decoupling laws where you decouple the energy production from the profits the uh, utility is making, you're incentivizing a reduction of energy production. Um, that is like a really effective policy. That's just one of many kinds of ways. And then ERS policies. Uh, and advertising marketing can work. You know, I, I thought that when I was in grad school, like social psychology, environmental psychology is the way. And marketing and advertising, those guys don't know what they're doing. But as I got out of it, I met people through the Beck conference. Um, I learned that they have a very intuitive understanding of what changes behavior. It's it really does work. They understand emotions and decision making and stuff like that. So, you know, let's not ignore that. Um, and what behavioral science brings, I think, is a theory driven approach and strong implementation and evaluation methods. That's what we do. We can um, get out there and see what really works by in, by giving a good evaluation strategy. And I think that that's something that's sort of undersold. That's our unique contribution. Uh, okay, so where do we stand? Social psychology and behavioral economics can help, but it is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, use social psychology approaches alongside traditional approaches. Um, and that's it, thank you. Um, 
that's my so um, we're running a little bit behind but i definitely want to give uh felix a chance to respond because he was taking notes a lot um during the time period so if you could you know just take maybe you know three to five minutes so we get a few questions in but these have been wonderful comments we may need to do a follow-up conference or something we this might so it's so yeah. interesting yeah no this has been fantastic thank you all so much for engaging with this work and for your really thoughtful commentary and feedback um and Thank you to whoever put you all up here. Uh, I'm so thrilled that uh, there are so many smart people sitting here. Um, yes. And yes, I, I don't know about a follow-up conference, but this makes me definitely think about a follow-up article. <laughs> um, so, so let me try to take these uh, in order. Um, Lisa, you and uh, Ruben both talked about you know, the context in which nudges occur. And I just want to clarify one thing. Nowhere in the paper do I say that nudges are a wholesale substitute of the panacea. The paper is very clear, Ruben, about the fact that I think they're supposed to provide incremental advancements around the margins, the edges, if you will, of the existing, whether it's command and control, whether it's market-based policy. So I just want to you know, clarify that to your point also, Lisa, I think nudges have a huge part to play, and right now they're underutilized, mm -hmm. but we can't just throw out you know, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water mm -hmm. Act, the ESA, and say, hey, we don't need you anymore. It's, it's all it's all Sunstein's work and those who came before him that he cites. Um, you know, relatedly, several of you have talked about the need for methods and iterative design and learning. Yes, I mean, this is completely a work in progress because we still know so little about how the, the mind works. I mean, you talked about marketers. Um, I happen to be married to a uh, marketing uh, professor whose postdoc was in neuroscience. Uh, and you know, and that's to better understand and not just go with survey experiments, to better understand the cognitive processes in this space. And I think we have such a long way to go on that, on that still. Um, relatedly, of course, also uh, Adela, your your point about no one size fits all 100 percent true. And I thought it was really interesting. One common theme I, I heard from several of you is, you know, be careful what you wish for, mm -hmm. in the sense that as these choice architectural interventions, these behaviorally informed policies gain more traction, they become more of a target as well. I think that's your point, and I think that was your point as well. And, you know, on the one hand, I feel like that's a good thing, because at that point, you know you've arrived. When people start picking on you, you know, the, the thing they tell you early on in your academic career, if you give a talk and it's silent afterwards, you've really blown it. <laughs> if there's clamor and, and they're really upset with you, at least you've promoted, you know, you've solicited a response. Right. You, you might have alienated people, but it's something. So you're relevant in a way, right? <laughs> so we want for these policies to be relevant. And, and in that sense, I think it's good. But it's 100% true that no one size fits all. So the empirical data I showed you about our survey experiment with the investment framing and the climate ratings, uh, the good news was politics were controlled for a lot of factors. Political persuasion did not change. I mean, it changed a little bit, but the intervention was effective even if you had self-identified as highly conservative on the political spectrum. Same thing, you didn't have to be environmentalist. We controlled for that through some of the typical tried and true, you know, tests and questionnaires here. And the same thing, even if you self-identified, you know, through a series of questions as not caring overly about the environment, you still felt this, this made sense. So it's these synergies where you realize, and several of you have pointed to this, it's about helping folks make the decision that most advances even their self-interests. And that's a response, I think, also to the paternalism critique here. Um, so again, again, lots on that front, uh, probably because of the recency effect. I'm going to engage a little more again with, with Dr. Sussman's uh, conversation here. So you know, one thing you questioned is whether or not text reminders are part of choice architecture, um, because you know, it's not necessarily decision related. Well, to the extent that they seek to promote compliance, compliance is about repeatedly making the right decision. And so the text reminder, just as Ms. Scott reminded us, you know, when you give these reminders to your tenants, to the personnel whose behavior you try to shape, you know, they have to make those decisions time and again. And that in turn then helps form the habits that, that I think you, you, you question. So while I don't want to overstate the case for common choice architecture or choice architecture more generally, and I don't think I do so in the paper. I apologize if I didn't make the, uh, the caveat earlier and more strongly that this is just supposed to be additional um, policy options. Um, I, I do think that there's a lot there, um, even if it's maybe not as benign as, as we think, because yes, I agree. I mean, these default options, you, you're, you know, 
I understand anyone who, who cries foul and says this is paternalistic. It is to a point. The question is, do we think that more often than not, it helps people make a decision that ultimately furthers their self-interest? And, and that's often brought forth as a justification. I could go on. Uh, I'm hoping to, to talk more among this group and, yeah. and with anyone during the break, et cetera. But I also want to make sure we have time for, for your questions Wonderful. and questions on Yeah, thank yeah. you. And because of the webinar component, we really are going to stay on time. Uh, but Michael's going to ask the first question. And then as you suggested, if you all wouldn't mind staying so people here can just come up and chat with you and ask questions, that would be wonderful. So Michael, you want to pose sure. a question? Yeah, so this article addresses cognitive biases on the part of consumers. I'm curious what you guys think are cognitive biases that potential regulators or business people might be blind to when they're designing these choice architecture systems. How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, who, Five minutes. Who, who wants to start? Because I don't want to hog all the, I, I know many of you- You're the authors, so go ahead. You start. Oh, okay, I, I mean, again, I think, I think where to begin. When we're talking climate change, I think most fundamentally, we all know how terrible humans are at properly assessing risk. You know, if, if it's something salient uh, on our minds, even if it's remote probabilities, you know, we're, we're, we're going to take all sorts of precautions. But because climate change has historically had this way of sneaking up on us, um, we are now seeing more and more manifestations of climate change. But we've, if you will, wasted much of the past 20, 30 years because it seemed to be so far away. And so we, we discounted it too much. So that's to me the starting point, but we, we can go anywhere. I mean, it's whether it's mental accounting, whether it's, you know, our poor ability to, to discount temporally. I, I think it's, there's so much which in a way is frustrating at the same time gives us hope that these are potential inlets for um, access points for, for these kinds of interventions. Anyone else want to jump in on that one or go to an audience question or I know Mike has a question. One thing I see all the time, I'll be interested in your reaction to this, is both government regulators and NGOs fail to understand the power of social norms on some level and the fact that everyone wants to do what everyone else is doing. So you'll often see an EPA enforcement official come out and essentially say, look, everyone's not complying with the law and we took an enforcement action as opposed to almost everyone's complying with the law and we found the occasional one-off and we sanctioned them. And you see the same thing with NGOs. Nobody's fulfilling their carbon neutral commitments or, or net zero commitments. The far better message if you want to induce compliance is a remarkable number are and a few aren't and we're going to shame them. And it seems interesting to me that that's not become a more common lesson. I, I think that's that's 100% true. And there's there's so much, again, None of this requires a change in the law, right? It's, it's really about communication mm -hmm. and it's about uh, changing the communication with it. Mm -hmm. one, one thing I wanted to add to the Opower example also, which, which I thought was great, is to see that that's a prime example of something you all have cautioned against, which is be careful you know, with the political sensitivities of some constituents because not every participant in those studies, at least the studies I'm familiar with, um, actually complied. Some said, you don't get to tell me what I do. Uh, and if, if I want to keep my lights on, I'm going to keep my lights on and I'm going to show the Joneses down the block because I know they're voting for the other party and I don't want to be in the same category even as them. I have to live on the same block. That's bad enough. So <laughs> there, there is that. But you're 100 percent right. A lot of the friends we still see this, you know, don't litter. Right. Um, it, it makes you think, well, of course I don't litter. But the fact that you can show me the sign mm -hmm. makes me wonder, mm -hmm. oh, it's even a possibility. There's a lot of this where we don't understand the human reaction, and even to the extent that we understand it, we are underutilizing that part. Yeah, just I'll just say I think that I mean it's just on your question and those responses, I think that the I think the tendency of government regulation or you know government policy makers is to think I want something that's going to kind of have a defined outcome. Like I, mm -hmm. I like I want to be able to say. Um, it's a cap, you know, like the like emissions are going to be this, you know, uh, ra rather than say um, a cap versus like say a tax where it's like, well, it's going to direct this in this way, but I'm not sure, you know, people might just be willing to pay that money and then we're just still going to have emissions, like how these perform in real life. And I think that that's one question people would have about, you know, what, um, whether they want to take a chance on like policies that do that because they may not be convinced about the efficacy versus something where they think in their mind, you know, oh no, I'm going to just ban this thing where I'm going to put a really big tax on it so people don't drink safe sugary drinks or whatever. Uh, so I, I think it might just be, you know, again, this community practice idea. I think people could see how well these things work and build confidence in then 
using them in, in real life. People, people don't just go from an academic paper and say, I'm going to do that. They need to see their buddy down the street who ran, mm -hmm. who ran this experiment in real life and saw it work, you know, and that, that's, I think we need to do more of that. I really hate to end this panel because I think it's just a fascinating discussion, but we are going to try to stay on time. So please, you know, feel free to come up and chat. We have a 10 minute break webinar participants. I'm sorry, but the feed is still live. So you might want to just mute on your end until we get started again. Uh, but please join me in thanking this great panel. Oh, your paper was so cool. I was like, no, it was really good. Um, I am a part of the things for the day. But I But I did, I did really go about the two thousand for I do want to know this is like one more thing. Yes. And you said that too, but once in a while, you know, it's not that hard. Yeah. But yeah, I want to connect to the idea of Yeah. Let's take away their choice. Share the words. Yeah, and I'll find a different service. So we can show you that. Um, Freedom is even better when I sit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right, thank you too. Great job, everybody. I'll, I'll email everybody because I have about 10 thoughts and lots of questions. And we're all in the same email. I actually don't want to feel that. Where are you? I don't know. 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 I Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah
Oh, so Joy, are you uh, okay. over, yeah. over inside the wall? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah
Just other people don't forget it. Yeah, and it's all over that much. Yeah, Natalia is going to be introducing. If everyone's here, we're going to get started. Yeah, just for the record. Yep, they've got, um, they've got, yeah, during that class when I sent them to the next one, they can see the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think some of it is very exposing. Yeah, there are issues of stress, but I think those tend to be pretty new ones. Study it started. We're trying to stay on time for our webinar participants. And in fact, um, our webinar participant is going to introduce our panel virtually. Natalia Horst is um, one of our um, LPAR students and the article editor for this. And uh, Natalia, over to you to do the introduction. Hello, everyone. It's very meta to see myself, see you all looking at myself on the screen, but I'm so glad to be here virtually. Um, I, my name is Natalia Wurst. I'm a third year law student and an LPAR article editor. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing Deals in the Heartland, Renewable Energy Projects, Local Resistance, and How Law Can Help by Christiana Ochoa, Casey Cook, and Hannah Wheel. Um, I'll be introducing first Professor Ochoa. She is the Dean and Ehrman B. Wells Class of 1950 endowed professor at Indiana University Marr School of Law. Uh, Professor Ochoa's research seeks to understand how economic activity impacts human and ecological well-being. Her theoretical and empirical research relies on international and comparative law, particularly in the fields of business and human rights, law and development, international finance, and foreign direct investment. Her scholarship in these areas has been published and is forthcoming in the Minnesota Law Review, Yale Journal of International Law, Harvard International Law Journal, and Virginia Journal of International Law, among others. She has also produced a documentary film, Otra Cosa No Hay, There Is Nothing Else, which addresses the effects of large-scale global mining in the Colombian Highlands. She received her BA from the University of Michigan and her JD from Harvard University. Next, I'll be introducing another co-author, Hannah Wheel. She is a 2024 JD candidate from the University of Minnesota Law School. And she graduated from Indiana University in 2021, where she received a BA with highest distinction in international studies with a concentration in global development and minors in Spanish political science and environmental studies. Congrats on almost graduating, Hannah. Um, next, we have Hillary Clark. Um, Hillary Clark is the Senior Director of Siting and Permitting Social Licensing at the American Clean Power Association where she leads non-wildlife siting, regulatory, and policy direction for deployment of clean energy projects, as well as leads on local affair efforts for the industry. Before joining ACP, Hillary worked for engineering consulting firms where she led land use and environmental planning efforts for siting and permitting various development projects, including utility scale wind and solar projects. She began her career in 2004 with a small consulting firm where as a project lead, she advised clients and stakeholders on project development issues, policy changes and regulatory framework. Hillary earned her BA in biology from the University of San Diego and her MA in international environmental policy from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Next we have Eric Lance. Eric is the director of Wind Energy Technologies at the US Department of Energy. He oversees an annual budget of over 100 million to advance wind technology and support an equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. Previously, Eric served in multiple roles at DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and most recently was a research manager at the National Wind Technology Center. He holds a Master of Science in Energy Policy from the University of Colorado, and has made significant contributions to more than 70 wind energy publications during his tenure in the wind energy industry. And next up, we have Josh Nandelbaum. 
Josh is a senior attorney at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, and he is a Des Moines-based senior attorney whose practice focus on, focuses on clean energy and clean water, and his work helps to facilitate the Midwest transition to a clean energy economy. Before joining AOPC, Josh practiced law with Lane & Waterman LLP in Davenport, Iowa, and he previously served as a senior policy advisor to Iowa Governor Thomas J. Vilsack. Josh is a graduate of Brown University and the University of Iowa College of Law, as well as a Truman Scholar. He currently serves on the Des Moines City Council. And last but not least, we have Mr. Christopher McLean. Christopher is the Assistant Administrator for the Electric Programs at the Rural Utility Service. This is Chris's third time at RUS. He served as Acting Administrator for the first 20 months of the Biden administration, where he oversaw the agency's investments in electric, telecommunications, and water infrastructure. He was previously a senior advisor to the RUS administrator, and he co-owned E. Copernicus, which is a consulting firm, and was the executive director of the Consumer Electronics Retailers Coalition. In the Clinton administration, Chris also served as RUS deputy administrator, and he spent 15 and a half years of his federal career as a Senate staffer. He received his LLM in International and Comparative Law from Georgetown University, a JD from Creighton University School of Law, and a degree in Business Administration from, from Creighton University. And lastly, I want to give a special shout out to Casey Cook, a co-author who's in the audience. Thank you also so much for your work and for being here with us. And with all of that, I will pass it back over to Professor Bergen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Oh my gosh, another incredible panel. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being here. And I think Hannah's going to kick this off. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for including us in LPAR, and thank you to ELI for hosting. Um, go ahead and get started. So aggressive climate goals depend on the rapid expansion of wind capacity. Over the past 20 years, total energy capacity from installed wind farms in the United States has grown rapidly from 2,472 megawatts in 1999 to 109,919 megawatts in 2020. Turbines are getting larger and larger so they can reach further into the sky and catch larger gusts of wind. But wind energy is very different from energy projects of yesteryear. It's not like a coal plant or another type of electric plant where a single large energy project provides all the necessary electricity in a large geographic area. Rather, the renewable energy grid relies on a decentralized design that takes up quite a bit of space. To illustrate, this is a picture of the locations of commercial wind farms in the United States. And these blotches here represent 75,000 wind turbines. Zooming in, this is a picture of Indiana's commercial wind farms, and next to it is a zoomed in view of just one small portion of Indiana's 1600 wind turbines. This next picture zooms in quite a bit closer, and what I want you to notice here is the large number of farms implicated in just this very small portion of wind turbine installations in a small corner of just Indiana. This is important to keep in mind because rural communities and private landowners act as the ultimate gatekeepers to situating wind turbines in any particular location. Just within the United States, millions of acres of open land are already foreclosed to renewable energy projects because of rapidly increasing and well-organized opposition to rural communities targeted by wind developers. Indeed, the story of the creation of renewable energy infrastructure is increasingly riddled with conflict and resistance. Our research sought to shine a light on the factors leading individual communities and landowners to welcome, but also often to reject wind projects. Through this focus on communities, we sought to understand the legal structures and financial incentives, both easing and impeding the necessary and massive expansion of national wind power capacity in the hopes that understanding the source of resistance can better tailor both the public and private sector approaches to local communities so that the path can be open to large-scale renewable energy projects. This article explores how public law can be better marshaled to facilitate deals and stable relationships between communities and wind companies. 
Too often, we found public law is focused on the commercial wind farm operators and not on the community and individuals that have this weed keeping role. The relationships and deals between wind companies and local communities play crucial roles in addressing the complex global public problem of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So before we get into our findings, I just wanna to briefly touch on our methodology and the history of wind in Indiana. Indiana's first wind farm became operational in 2008 in Benton County, which is in the Northwestern corner of the state. To the outside observer, there were no notable signs of resistance or conflict related to that project or to the ensuing expansion of wind energy projects in Benton County, such as the Bower Ridge Wind Farm and neighboring White County, which has the Meadow Lake and Indiana Crossroads Wind Farm. Together, Benton and White counties have an installed wind energy capacity that is three times larger than the remainder of the entire state. But the relative ease with which these wind farms were built did not carry over to the whole of Indiana. Outside of Benton and White counties, only four other Indiana counties have permitted wind farms in their communities. And more importantly, in the time since 2008, no fewer than 30 Indiana counties have either placed outright moratoriums on wind farm construction or have passed land use ordinances that effectively prohibit wind farms within the county's borders. This represents a very large portion of Indiana's high wind area. We were interested in a variety of counties representing a broad array of reactions to wind. We were interested in Benton and White counties, but we also looked into counties like Henry and Tipton counties which had initially developed zoning ordinances favorable to commercial wind projects and later changed course, adopting prohibitive ordinances or outright bans on large scale wind turbines. Over the course of nearly 30 hours of interviews in 2021, spanning 11 Indiana counties, we spoke with anti-wind activists, company representatives, county officials, and county economic development corporation officers. We also spoke with employees at regional, state, and national governmental and non-governmental organizations focused on the expansion of wind energy and the conflicts cre it's creating in local communities. This field work supplemented our comprehensive research on wind farms, including the presence and absence of wind farms and their dates of construction, the presence, absence, content, and dates of adoption of county ordinances designed to attract, prohibit, or place moratoria on wind farm construction within the county limits, and all searchable court cases arising from controversies related to wind farms. We also collected information on court cases, statutes, and lobbying efforts at the state level connected to the expansion of wind energy in Indiana. In addition, we searched databases and ran general internet searches for local, state, and national news addressing wind energy development in Indiana. Um, so this is we're going to hand off to, to me. I'm going to present um, really many of our findings and the recommendations that arise from our research. But I also want to thank um, uh, Linda Bregan, uh, Professor uh, Van Berg, and uh, the organizers of this conference. It's really, it has been such a team effort to make this all come together. And I'm just incredibly grateful for the opportunity. And again, I, I, uh, Casey Cook, who's in the back of, of the room there, we're, uh, this project came together really as a team effort. And uh, just in the interest of time, only two of us are presenting. So as Hannah mentioned, conflicts over wind farms are deeply local. The majority of states have delegated at least some powers to municipality and often, often zoning powers are among that set of powers. And that has facilitated the majority of Indiana's wind viable counties into passing ordinances that effectively or actually prohibit new wind farms. In 2021, the Indiana legislature attempted to override that local power and create an industry favorable set of standards but that resulted in two thirds of Indiana's counties vociferously and very vigorously oppo opposing the, um, the effort to curb their local powers and the legislation died. In 2023, Indiana was successful in passing Senate Bill to, uh, 390, which encourages counties to adopt a set of uniform wind energy ready zoning standards by offering them financial incentives. However, of Indiana's 92 counties, it appears that to date only two counties have met all of the standards necessary um, in that legislation. So what's clear is that legislative approaches are not proving sufficient or sufficiently quick uh, to override local level resistance. And that means that understanding what is happening at the local level on the ground is key to resolving these local <laughs> impasses. Our research uncovered that there are four, that the four strongest sources of community-based resistance to wind farms, to wind farms taking root in Indiana and likely in other spaces in the rural United States are poor engagement practices or poor process, the substance of the deals that are struck uh, for wind farms and with whom they are struck, 
the inevitable viewscape changes wrought by wind farms and the impacts on property values. And I'll talk about each of those just briefly. Without question, the most pervasive feature of our interviews throughout Indiana um, uh, is distress about the process by which wind developers engage with communities. The deals structure leases and options, county ordinances, economic development agreements, tax abatements, et cetera, are widely perceived as secretive, non-transparent, non-inclusive, and offering insufficient opportunities for participation in the design of projects and in the decisions over whether and how they may proceed in a given location. One interviewee conveyed a common sentiment when he said, we got steamrolled. We kept feeling like it wasn't legal. The words of others are similarly striking. The re uh, quotes like, the result is that we didn't know until the deals were all but done, very late in the game. We had the sense that the commission was not going to follow the rules. The cumulative effect is that people who might have been agreeable or neutral on wind farms at the start turned against them. One interviewee summed up that sentiment by saying, I'm not anti-wind, I'm anti how it was done here. So there are uh, lots of reasons to oppose wind farms, it seems. Residents, tenant farmers, and neighbors all have reasons to oppose wind farms. That means that when oppositions to wind farms take hold, it takes hold uh, uh, quickly and with force. And so some residents have, owned, for example, some residents have owned and worked uh, their farms for over 200 years. Uh, they have deep roots there. And for them, the arrival of industrial farms is not a welcome development. It's going to change the way they live in the farms they've occupied for hundreds of years. Um, uh, some of the largest farms, though, are owned by absentee landlords and uh, landlord uh, uh, owners. And we learned, as one person put it, that the vast majority of people that signed up don't live on the land. One farmer signed up for 49 turbines without regard to his tenants. That is roughly 50 acres of land that is no longer available for the tenant uh, to yield uh, uh, products from the, from the land. The result is that the leaders of the opposition are often tenant farmers. The close neighbors of wind farms are also among the most aggrieved, given that neighbors are often in the noise and flicker zone of turbines and, ex and experience vastly changed landscapes while typically receiving very little or no direct compensation as a result. The failure to share sufficient economic benefit of wind farms with the broad community was a common and unfortunate complaint. In one Indiana county, the Economic Development Corporation intends to use funds to increase access to broadband internet um, across that rural area um, and also improve the roads in that rural area. But we found uh, that for the residents there, they have skepticism about that, recognizing that the broadband internet is necessary for the turbines and the roads that were being improved were the very roads that were being nece that were necessary to install the turbines mm -hmm. and to maintain them. And that leaves residents asking, really, really, what's in it for the town? Um, the result is that for people who um, have lost wind farm battles or never fought them, um, they're seeing their surroundings transformed. They're, they're transformed from rural countryside uh, farmland with wide open vistas uh, uh, to uh, large scale industrial energy producing facilities. Turbines come together with transformer stations and, uh, and a system of large and obtrusive transmission towers and lines used to carry electricity over long distances. On a clear day, you can see the 410 foot turbines from about seven miles away. And to fully capture the effect, you'd have to imagine being on this farm um, with incessant blinking red lights on every turbine in sight, all night long, every night, forever. So this of course results in concerns over property values. The literature on property values value effects is mixed, but it seems that in communities that have received wind farms, uh, despite notable opposition, properties located within about two and a half miles uh, of the turbines drop between five and 10%. So why care? With respect to some of these concerns, we've heard a lot of dismissive sentiments, sentiments like these are rural people's problems or express any number of anti-rural sentiments that align with political divides. But there are at least three reasons to care. First, uh, transitioning to renewable energy will be slower and more difficult if we don't pay attention. Remember, more than 30 of Indiana's wind viable counties blocked wind farms, and that's happening in other rural spaces in the country and other spaces in, in the world as well. Second, local politics and, election, uh, and elections are distorting. And that is a, a, an unexpected uh, ex externality that we should also be paying attention to. In small communities, this type of mobilization is unusual and it's resulted in strident single issue elections for the purpose of ensuring anti-wind farm ordinances will be passed soon after that election. As one interviewee stated, our county government is substantially different as a result of wind farms. Incumbents are losing even to unknown people with no experience. And we should all be concerned about that. Local communities are suffering. Finally, there's an enduring erosion of the value of living in a, in a peaceful community. Some interlocutors described feeling threatened or still very uneasy even four years after a vote um, over wind farms. Um, 
So we do have a set of recommendations. The current practice of, of, of wind companies and local uh, communities are not working. Outsider wind energy companies have to engage communities early, transparently, respect, respectfully, and generously to credibly propose mutually beneficial relationships that can last. We have three basic recommendations. Companies would be well advised to take the burden these communities are bearing seriously, to fully acknowledge it. Their well-being and their life satisfaction stands to be very negatively impacted, and that needs to be recognized in order to overcome the current state of affairs. With respect to the process, I've described just a snippet of the negative stories we heard in our field work about the interactions with companies. Company engagement and processes, uh, and processes have to be much, much better. Many of these recommendations are drawn uh, um, from the free prior informed uh, consent literature that you find in, in, uh, international develop, in the international development context. And the paper goes into to significantly more detail than I will here, but essentially we recommend that companies publicly, publicly register their interest in the location and regularly report on progress toward the realization of that investment in a very open and transparent fashion that gets passed along to the residents of the community. Transparency is important. Information should be frequent, um, and as complete as possible. Such information uh, should include effects on property values, health effects, the effects on birds and bats, and all of the other concerns that we found in our, in our field work and that are found in a particular community. It must also include robust information about the revenues paid and the public projects funded as a result of the company's operations. All of this right now is too occlusive. We recommend earnest engagement by, the company, by companies and early and ongoing earnest participation with the community in conversations about how to best align a wind project and what each party expects from the ongoing relationship between the company and the communities. Building trust is critically important. The paper also makes, makes recommendations about how to enhance the substance of the deals. One consequence of not recognizing the burden that local re residents are asked to bear is that, it, that the deals that companies offer to communities are not perceived by local communities as, as adequate to, stand, to, to compensate for all they stand to lose. This is a lost opportunity for revitalizing rural communities. The paper provides a, a number of suggestions for assuring that local communities are receiving tangible and enduring benefits in exchange for the burdens that are bear. We point to contingent tax incentives, tax credits, federal and state government grants, and permanent fund dividends as, uh, as potential tools for enhancing the benefits that local communities uh, can receive both immediately and in the long term. The recommendations that we've made are not easy to implement and they will not always be successful. Still, we believe that they're valuable and necessary given our urgent need for a rapid transition to renewable energy. We recognize that some may prefer a, a, a quicker steamroller approach that is increasingly being advocated, or at least they imagine that it's quicker, but we simply don't think that those approaches are currently viable, and in the long run, we think they'll be slower. The proposals we've made here can create new models for individuals, groups, and communities to more openly consider tangible benefits that will come along with the undeniable burdens they'll bear if or when a wind farm is constructed in their locations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to remind webinar participants, put your questions in the Q&A box, and Hillary, we're going to hand it over to you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to um, participate and um, share in the discussion. I think it's an important discussion. Um, I kind of, I come sort of at a high level. I'm going to kind of address some of the high level topics. We could easily get into the weeds on a lot of these um, discussions, and it is it, it is an industry that invokes a lot of emotion and people come at it with a lot of emotion. So I just want to step back and kind of highlight some of the high level. Um, you see the slide popping up. Oh, there we go. I just kind of wanted to level set on sort of truth about wind uh, since this project really focused on wind. It did talk about renewables in general and clean energy, but did focus on the wind. Um, if you want to, next slide, great. So here's just some uh, wind energy facts in the U.S. If there is actually 150 gigawatts of wind installed wind capacity across the U.S., with, which they did mention greater than 72,000 wind turbines currently operating across the U.S. It generates about 10% of the electricity in the U.S. I'm not going to go through all the, the bullets in, in the interest of time, but there is a significant amount of capital investment that has been um, in, across the U.S., um, from wind energy. You want to jump to Indiana? And then just some basic facts on Indiana, the installed capacity currently in Indiana, 29 projects, um, 24.6 
million dollars in state and local taxes, $23.2 million in average um, annual lease payments. I did break that down into the, the average uh, land lease payment per megawatt for a landowner. So it does add um, a significant amount of income to landowners who do install and want to host these um, that helps diversify what their property is and helps them supplement um, some of their um, income. So unfortunately, this study does highlight a current trend across the U.S. that we're seeing. Local opposition is one of the threats to um, deploying clean energy, and it is something that we are seeing increasingly across different states. In 2023, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law in, at Columbia Law School found organized opposition in 35 states, resulting in at least 228 significant local restrictions against wind and solar and other renewable energy facilities. However, um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has looked at attitudes towards wind and attitudes toward sol towards solar in some of their um, recent surveys. And even though we're seeing an uptick in local opposition and some of the things that they highlighted in this article, generally the attitudes towards these projects once installed are positive. Um, the attitudes towards wind showed that the majority of people over time did have a positive attitude towards the projects they lived near. Um, similarly, uh, with solar, 80, in a recent survey for solar attitudes, 85% of the respondents had a positive or neutral attitude towards the projects they lived near. And the overall positive attitudes outnumbered the negative by three to one margin in those surveys. So we are seeing um, more positive attitudes towards these projects, but they can be drowned out by the opposition tactics, um, which is highlighted in this article. Um, additionally, the study did indicate that fairness of the process, which this article highlighted, is one of the factors, one of the main factors that can influence people's attitudes, the idea or the perception of the fairness of, of the process. And that is something that the industry recognizes we can do better. Um, there have been, you know, in the past, there may have been some mistakes made and the industry recognizes there are things that we can be doing that are better to help engage with the community we hear the early and often communications. Um, we hear the early and often talking to the, the local community, sharing information, working with the trusted advisors, sharing data. So that is something the industry recognizes that, and we are working towards um, doing. However, I do feel that the article disproportionately um, focuses on the negative and the opposition talking point. They reiterate a lot of the negative um, impacts around wildlife, sound, health, aesthetics, and shadow flicker and, and property values. I did bring some of the, the kind of talking points on those and some data for, for the health. Um, even though they, they mention you know, opposition and a lot of times the, the people that are skeptical of these projects will say we're concerned about health. There are hundreds of studies over 20 years that do show that wind turbines do not have significant health impacts. Um, similarly with shadow flicker, there are studies that show that shadow flicker does not result in negative health impacts. We do see that several um, property value studies, while there may be an initial dip upon mention of a project during construction, we do recognize in those studies that there could be a negative dip in some property values adjacent to in the immediate vicinity they do recover over time within five to seven years. And so there are no, there's no evidence of long-term property value impacts adjacent to these projects. So I think it's important to kind of level set some of those, um, those ideas and just to be able to counter some of the opposition tactics. Because I think in let, if these articles don't do that, we're playing into the opposition and we're kind of saying, we're not sharing the actual data that's out there. And I think that's where these articles, while they're important to, to go through and highlight the, the challenges that we're facing, it's also important to highlight the actual data around some of these topics. Um, landscape as well, you know, that we do recognize there is a change in landscape. Although visual impacts are 
subjective. What some what one person might find as a negative, another person might find as a positive. And we do see that in some kind of some of these um, studies around attitudes. So as I mentioned, you know, the industry does agree that there are rooms for improvement. Um, the article does highlight a lot of recommendations that they, they gave through their um, summary. However, they're not as simple as they may seem. And I, they did kind of allude to the implementation can be challenging. I think, for example, um, recommendation one, registering interest in reporting process could likely do the opposite uh, than, than what, um, what the article implies. And it could result in an unfavorable development conditions and uncertainty. Um, development and power markets are competitive. And so this type of registration or reporting could cause developers to look elsewhere as it could give competitors insights as to their development plans before they're fully set. So I think it's important to recognize that while well intended, it could actually do the opposite and create a, um, a market where developers may not find it as favorable. It could also result in the opposition getting a head start and trying to influence the communities and landowners. And we have heard anecdotally from um, some communities that opposition can intimidate landowners who are interested in signing leases. We have we hear that anecdotally that there are some intimidation tactics. So again, it kind of leads to that that the opposition can use some pretty strong aggressive tactics. Um, and then on with regards to community benefit agreements, as mentioned, you know, developers often do make these arrangements um, to provide financial and other benefits to communities beyond the taxes paid and beyond the economic benefits from construction and operations. Um, in some cases, they do so with the neighboring landowners as well, as mentioned. Um, however, when you start mandating these types of um, agreements and requiring the uniformity, it removes the flexibility that, uh, that can be important for developers in tailoring these plans for specific projects and communities and ensuring the viable project economically or otherwise. So I think it's important to think about the potential converse of you know, something that's well intended could do the opposite. So I, we need to you know, think about that as well. And then re requiring property value guarantees or a 1% royalty on top of the taxes could also be cost prohibitive for development. The profit margins of these projects are small. Um, they don't have a whole lot of flexibility in there. So requiring something like a property value guarantee or adding a 1% um, royalty on top of the taxes that are already paid could be a cost prohibitive and um, could be cost prohibitive for development. And the developers might look elsewhere to, to um, build their projects because they wouldn't be able to, to economically build their projects in that community. Um, so more things to think about, a lot goes into citing these projects. Developers weigh many factors, including the, the um, transmission interconnection, environmental constraints, land use, industry, to build trust with host, host communities through, um, through transparent communication throughout all stages of the projects is important and we recognize that. And they can also include you know, community meetings, open houses, sharing data and, with trusted um, sources, engaging with the community leaders more regularly. These are all things that are really important and the industry recognizes um, it's important to, to move these projects forward. So um, we are in agreement that there are things that can be, can be done. It's just important to recognize the implementation and getting too prescriptive on some of these can become more prohibitive than helpful. And they can also be used um, as they can be weaponized for that. So there might be a community that says, oh, we're gonna write this in knowing that it will be a de facto ban on projects. So we, we do just need to consider all of those aspects. But thank you. Well, thank you. Eric, we're going to get to you. I have to say, you know, I was old enough to have 70 publications or to have contributed to 70. Uh, you are, you must uh, work very long hours. No, it's, um, you know, I have lots of good colleagues that uh, <laughs> take my contributions and put them on papers. Uh, very, very sure. Um, no, it's, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for including me on this panel. Um, 
I just want to echo something Hillary said at the, the top. This just tends to be an emotionally charged issue. Um, and I think it's also one that requires a lot of nuance. Um, from my experience in our past research, uh, the nuance is incredibly important here. And those two things don't often go well together. Um, two other just quick comments before I get into my more prepared remarks. Uh, one is, like you saw some images in the first presentation of like the sort of, you know, what the footprint of wind energy looks like at a national scale and then zoomed into more local scales. I've actually been responsible for creating tons of images like that. I think our current, <laughs> yeah, uh, we find and, and really close colleagues are the ones that produced the U.S. wind turbine database that was featured there. Um, I do think, though, that uh, having done that for several years, it doesn't give a complete picture of what wind energy looks like on the landscape. I think it can be really, especially when you zoom out to the national level, like you just can't compare the footprint of a turbine uh, at a continental scale. It just like just, our minds can't do that. And so it's a, a somewhat of a, it's a useful, but also incomplete picture. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I have to catch a flight. Uh, so I might have to, like, I've got to leave right at 1230. So if for some reason things run long and I have to, to, to leave, it's not because of anything that's happening on the channel. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just- You didn't leave it discussed yeah, or anything. Yeah, yeah so. no, no, no. I, I'll I, have to delete the tweet I was about to <laughs> Yeah, right. It's storming now. Yeah, no, so um, yeah, I'm just on a, on a tight schedule. Um, all right, so with that in mind, I think the article that's been presented before us uh, today, it's a, it's a thought-provoking piece that does coincide with a lot of significant growth in the wind industry, as well as broad-based expansion of county level ordinances regulating wind power. This is data that we've tracked and, and we've seen a significant uptick in county level ordinances. Um, I do think it's a useful contribution uh, to the literature and to the, to the conversation around this topic, which is a very important one and one that's near and dear to me personally as well. Um, but I do think in the vein of that nuance that I talked about up, up front, like I have a handful of comments that I'd like to include in the conversation uh, and in the public discourse here uh, for the sake of, of really drilling in on some specific uh, areas. Um, before I kind of delve into the specifics though, I did just want to say a little bit more about my background and how my perspective has been shaped. Um, I started studying the social acceptance of wind energy in 2007. I was invited to be part of an international working group uh, with researchers from uh, Northern Europe and from Japan and from the US, kind of trying to understand how we can better integrate uh, wind energy into uh, society. Um, and I did that uh, while actually as a graduate student uh, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, it was a real privilege being able to work with both social scientists and practitioners, um, you know, trying to tackle an important topic that I, I even thought was important then. And I recognized that in order for us to be successful with wind energy projects, uh, we need to have partnerships and we need to have the local community buy-in. Um, I also had the opportunity through that participation in that working group to influence where the, where the research has gone. So some of the studies that Hillary was alluding to, um, I've been a, a key part of helping create those and and really trying to uh, work with colleagues to understand a lot of the subtleties and nuances that are associated with human experiences of wind turbines. Um, just as one example there, I was able to participate in uh, the social acceptance baseline study, which Hillary alluded to. It was led by colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. What we focused on there was uh, actually studying and surveying in, with very scientific methods uh, the experience of people who lived next to wind turbines. So prior to that, most of the literature internationally had just been sort of general surveys, like what do people think about wind energy? But no one had, you know, only in a few examples, in Sweden in particular, uh, but only in a few examples uh, had people actually said, let's talk to the people who, are, who have lived next to wind turbines for an extended period of time, who have been through this process and have kind of a long view on it. And what we found is that, yes, there are some, there are individuals who, um, are frustrated, disappointed. Uh, there are people who have moved away, uh, but that there is a significant majority who are supportive or neutral towards the wind facilities. So um, yeah, that's just a little bit of, of kind of my background and the work that we've done trying to develop the data that, that Hillary was pointing to and that others have contributed to as well. Um, just a little bit about my current role. As was mentioned, I'm the director of the DOE's Wind Energy Technologies Office, so slightly different from some of the research in my past role. Um, we have a portfolio that spans fundamental science to technology de demonstration, but also capacity building for communities to be able to think about how they plan for and implement an energy transition. Uh, we're really focused on you know, catalyzing uh, 
a clean energy future. Um, so we want to think about how can we easily integrate wind energy technologies into the grid, the landscape, and the ecology. So wildlife is another issue. It hasn't been talked a lot about now, but wind energy obviously has impacts on wildlife and ecology. And so we're looking at ways we can optimize those things. Uh, within you know, the domain of, of social acceptance or human experience, uh, we're really interested in technologies and technical solutions that can alleviate community impacts uh, and the burdens that people are experiencing. Uh, we want to invest in capacity building that can support an overall energy transition. And of course, we're also really interested in financial regulatory and policy solutions, where I actually think there's a, a, a lot of work that can be done uh, to create financial structures, regulatory structures, and, and policy structures that can better balance the costs and benefits associated with clean energy deployment, including wind. Uh, so the first main point I want to emphasize in my commentary is that um, human experience with wind energy is highly subjective. Uh, this is particularly important with respect to the aesthetic perceptions of wind turbines and wind plants. Uh, throughout my time studying human experiences uh, with wind energy, the opinions have been you know, vastly differing. A lot of people talk about seeing wind turbines as like this, these sentinels of a new age uh, that pushing back against climate change and helping uh, create energy independence for local communities. On the other hand, I've also heard uh, kind of what was presented by the authors as you know, wind turbines as an industrial blight that's totally ruining the landscape uh, and the aesthetics of a particular area. Um, clearly though, how people experience the visual effects of wind energy is heavily impacted by what they bring to the table, essentially the stories that they've lived. And whether you see wind energy as you know, a bastion of technological advancement and humans overcoming uh, challenges, societal challenges, or something that's, you know, a negative uh, transformation of your landscape. That all depends on, on the individuals. Um, I thought this was particularly interesting. There's a snippet in the article that talks about the property values and how uh, at least one of the studies that was cited draw, drew a connection between property values and the social experience. So in communities where there was less conflict and where the plants were relatively well received, property value impacts were, were negligible and didn't even show up at all. Like they couldn't see any property values impacts. Whereas in those communities where it was more, um, more negative or more challenging, uh, you know, perhaps there's a social phenomena that you know, just results in lower, lower willingness to pay for homes and residences in those locations. It's really hard because this isn't necessarily something that, you know, maybe, there are, maybe there are specific differences about those particular projects that drove those things. But ultimately, like, it's really difficult to apply an objective measure to say, you know, property values are going to do X because, in fact, it can be a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we're welcoming to projects, then people aren't worried about it. On the other hand, if we're really high anxiety or very fearful of what might happen, then, of course, that gets talked about and it's going to affect your, your, your uh, home markets. Um, for the work that we've done in this space, which the DOE has funded a lot of uh, studies mostly at the national level, looking at property values impacts. So perhaps there are some, uh, uh, we apply, apply a very statistical approach. So, you know, there are clearly anecdotes that can be exceptions here, but if we can focus on the large scale statistics and kind of the, the average trends, um, as Hillary has suggested, the latest work in this space has shown that there can be impacts that happen during that time period, immediately following the announcement of a project until you get a few years of experience uh, of people living around the project. And of course, that's the point at which the unknowns are the greatest, right? Like people uh, in which your anxieties might be highest, um, you know a project is coming, you know it's gonna mean a change, but you don't know what that change is gonna look like. And so uh, you might be more fearful in those situations, but what they also see in the statistical trends is that on average, within five years, those home prices, even in those communities where you see a dip uh, return to a more normal long-term trend. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say about wind energy is related to its lifetime. And you know, we often talk about sort of the transformational nature of, of, these, impact, of these plants' impacts on the landscape. Um, but unlike a nuclear facility, a coal-powered uh, electricity generation plant, um, or even a natural gas facility, you know, by and large, at the end of a project's life, you can decommission and dispose of all of the equipment of that plant in a relatively economically and safe manner. Now, you might repower it, you might leave some of the concrete from the foundations in the ground, but it's much easier even to dig a wind turbine foundation out of the ground and restore that to a relatively pristine 
uh, you know, pre-wind facility condition than it is a nuclear power plant, right? <laughs> the legacies there are just tremendously different. Um, and so, you know, if there are particularly problematic turbines or if there's a plant that just ultimately doesn't work in a community, at the end of that facility's life, you can transition that land. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a permanent transformation. Maybe it will, and, and maybe people will, will become accustomed to living next to, to wind turbines in the same way that we live next to other sorts of human infrastructure, whether it's an interstate highway, uh, a shopping mall, even just a collector road that runs by many of our houses. So it could be integrated into the landscape and integrated into our culture and more broadly accepted over time. So I wouldn't want to say that, you know, if we're, we're going to tear all these facilities down in the future, but it's a possibility and it's far easier to do that uh, than it is to decommission something like a nuclear power plant, which is also often talked about in terms of uh, future clean electricity generation. Um, yeah, so another point that I wanted to make is that for many of the critical factors that affect human experiences, um, we know a lot about the science and engineering that drives those experiences. Um, I had a colleague in Germany who did great work looking at uh, sound and when people were bothered by the sound. And there's this, you know, there's this story that people will tell that they find particularly bothersome uh, when the turbines make a sound that's like shoes bouncing around in a dryer, right? And, mm. and this happens when the, the atmosphere is really unsteady and there's a lot of turbulence in the yeah. atmosphere. And so that's interacting with the blades. And so you get these aerodynamic sounds that are like a like shoes bouncing around in a dryer. Um, there are other uh, known, like shadow flicker is another one that, that we talk about. Shadow flicker is actually really easy to manage from an engineering perspective. We know what track the sun is gonna take every year and we know how those shadows are gonna be formed and we can very precisely figure out and model when and where shadow flicker could occur. Um, so we can predict many of these phenomena and plant operators and developers actually have tools that they can use to alter the operation of individual turbines or plants you know, to mitigate particularly bothersome periods of wind plant operations. So this is one of those areas where I think the nuance is incredibly important. We have tools that we can manage these impacts. It doesn't have to be a binary yes, no on wind. Um, one of the challenges though, is that oftentimes uh, what we hear in our conversations with uh, both um, manufacturers and you know, technology developers who are pursuing these types of solutions is that the customers, in this case, the developers aren't asking for those tools um, and there's a couple reasons for this. One is the really slim margins that, that Hillary alluded to that exist in this industry. Um, you know, we often as wind technology researchers get compared to the aerospace industry because we're dealing with composites, we're dealing with airfoils, uh, uh, but the, uh, the, the profit margins that exist in the electricity generation field are just orders of magnitude different than what you have in an in a, in a industry like aerospace. Um, it's really raised within there's stiff competition from other sources of electricity generation and there's a lot of societal pressure to keep power prices low right many utilities are regulated such that they have to accept the lowest cost form of electricity generation um, because ultimately low cost electricity is is good for society but there's a trade-off there and that's a particular place where like the legal and regulatory frameworks just like they're almost working against each other uh, in this instance um, so there's the profitability side of things and then there's the ability for communities to actually recognize that there's value in these engineered solutions to some of these challenges, that the, the tools that we have to make changes or to change the way we operate or design wind plants, um, people have to appreciate them and value them. And I think what we're seeing just empirically based on the marketplace right now is that people either aren't aware of them or don't value them. So they're not actually getting asked for and they're not getting developed and, and deployed. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about profit margins is that when you're developing a project, uh, the development period is the highest risk portion of the, of the capital stack that goes into wind energy facilities. It's, it's a relatively small piece compared to the overall cost of the facility, but it's totally exposed. When you're developing a project, you don't know if you actually have a project or not. And so you could lose all of that investment. And so that just creates, you know, I, to me, reasonable challenges about developer funded long and participatory development processes. I, I, I'm just not sure that that's, um, going to work in a, a, an industry like electricity where the margins are thin and there's a lot of pressure on power producers to keep prices um, very, very low. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh gosh, <laughs> sorry. I mean, this is fa fascinating. Yeah. I don't mean, I wish- I, I I'll, Yeah, I'll, I'll accelerate here. Um, a third point I wanted to make is that wind energy is not a monolith. Like we often talk about wind facilities 
um, as like a uniform thing. And they're really not, you know, wind facilities exist at all different sizes. Um, you go to a country like the Netherlands and you'll see turbines sprinkled here and there. You'll see them squeezed into niches, mm -hmm. uh, industrial landscapes mm -hmm. in, in urban centers. Um, and we really need to, I think in my mind, we need to exploit the diversity that's possible with wind energy in order to help solve some of these challenges too. Um, another point that I wanted to acknowledge here is just the complexity of balancing the costs and benefits. I've sort of hinted at this earlier already, but there, the, regula the regulations and the way prices are set in power markets are controlled by so many different factors, none of which, I'll go out on a limb and say that, none of which I think account for the experiences of the local communities where projects are cited. And that applies for any, any power generation technology, not, not only wind. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that I think that there are really significant power imbalances that exists both on the side of the developers and on the communities, right? So we heard a little bit about how developers may not be transparent and they can leverage those information asymmetries and that balance of power in order to try and get projects through. On the other hand, because we have so such broad-based home rule policies in this country um, and in many countries around the world, it's you know, by and large a good, a good policy measure, um, there's a lot of power in that commission. And you know, it can you're the 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 success of your project can come down to the votes of a few individuals. And so I think that's a power imbalance on the other side. Like I, I would love to see objective criteria be developed that can help inform uh, uh, you know, both how projects are developed and how they're approved uh, so that we can kind of rebalance some of these uh, power imbalances. Um, the last thing I'll say is just that um, I don't think we should just be asking the wind energy industry what they can do differently. We should also ask what communities can do differently and communities can take a proactive approach here. They can think about how they wanna develop wind energy or solar energy or other clean energy technologies in their community. And then they could even go out and solicit proposals for projects and pick from among those. So um, I don't think communities have to be purely in a reactive space and I'll leave it there. Sorry. No, I mean, it's just so much great information. So uh, thank you. And <laughs> Well, well, thank you. I'm Josh Mandelbaum. I'm a senior attorney at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, uh, and I'm based in Iowa, so uh, a state where we've got 13,000 megawatts of, of wind generation, a significant amount of generation. Uh, and I also have a, a second role, uh, not related to ELPC, but maybe relevant to this panel. I don't know if I was selected for that, but I'm a local elected official. Uh, mm -hmm. So I deal with zoning. Uh, I'm in a city, so I don't deal with the renewable siting, but but I know exactly how contentious these zoning discussions can be and the, the impacts it can have on a community. It's not unique to uh, not unique to rural Iowa, but it does impact how we solve problems in this country. Um, and, and so I bring that perspective as well. Uh, and and as a local elected official, I value the local control piece of this. Uh, I think this article is really important and really timely in that it asks some key questions uh, and, and makes some key, key points. You know, one of the, one of the observations and, and the rationale for tackling these issues I, that I think is very much true, uh, if we continue to do things as we have, there will be more projects that fail than would need to fail. And, and I think that's part of what we're trying to tackle. And that's part of the role that law plays. It's, it's this balancing role and trying to help navigate how we balance competing interests. And there are a lot of different competing interests that come into play. There are policy goals and there are different policy goals. I think the climate policy goal is a central one and that, that was one of, I think, the motivations of this article. Their local economic development, their quality of life goals that impact how local officials react on this. There's this broader philosophy of local control, uh, which is a pretty central piece of policy discussions in, in this country. Uh, but local control isn't necessarily an absolute. Um, it can exist on a continuum, and, and that sometimes is missing from this discussion. And then one piece that wasn't really talked about in this article, but that is very much, I think, relevant, uh, there's a property rights piece to all of this. And 
that property rights piece is what, what does the landowner get to do? But when you talk about land use, you're also talking about how you impact the property rights of, of neighbors. So there are all of these tensions. And I would add from a property rights perspective, I think that's a piece of the culture in a lot of rural communities as well. Uh, anecdotally, uh, my in-laws actually chose, they, my, uh, my father-in-law is a professor at Iowa State. They chose to live in rural Story County because his big hobby is ham radio. And he wanted to put a hundred foot tower in his backyard, which he couldn't do in the city, but he could do uh, in the rural part of the county. And that's a piece of why I think people live in parts of rural America. And that property rights piece is something that needs to be considered and valued as well. So part of the way I tried to approach this is to talk about principles in this larger structure and how principles related to renewable projects can, can help bring balance to, to this conflict. And it goes back to the lack of balance and, and how, we, how we engage there, but principles can make their way into law and be reflected in local or state law, but they can also, uh, they can also be something that just get reflected in the way developers approach projects. And that's important too, because I think we need to recognize not all developers are equal. Some approach in vastly different ways and that impacts a community's experience and principles can maybe help provide a check on what can sometimes be bad actors. Uh, I'm gonna talk about several key principles. Uh, the first, uh, I think the door should remain open for clean energy development. That's wind, solar, storage at all scales in all communities, including in rural working landscapes. And that takes, I think, one of the premises of this article. I'm not anti-wind, I'm anti how this was done and really try, you know, tries to engage with that and help solve that. Now, I think there's another piece that was acknowledged kind of in the conclusion that you know, even with all of the policy recommendations on transparency, compensation, there are some folks out there that are maybe gonna be anti-wind regardless. And this principle makes a policy determination and reflects that, that this is a direction that we need to go as well. Following from that is thinking about the regulatory role. And regulation should follow planning best practice. And, and you know, any variation on the regulation that deviates too much from best practice into de facto bans, that should be avoided. Um, and I'm gonna, I think, skip the slide and go on to this planning best practice idea. You know, there are a lot of different pieces to what can be covered in best practice. Some of that is setbacks, decommissioning, construction mitigation. It's gonna vary by technology. Some is gonna be different for wind versus solar. Uh, but those things are pretty well established and constantly getting worked on, but that should be reflected in, in policy and law. The de facto ban piece is, is a really important part of this. And that's a piece that I think we need to avoid in this, in this process. And that's where maybe local control goes too far. Uh, and you see that with setbacks, you see it with noise standards, um, in Iowa, we had uh, a solar bill proposed that would use corn suitability rating uh, related to solar projects. Those are all ways to, to get to de facto bans. And I had just a couple examples. I don't know, Eric, if you were involved in these charts or charts like these, <laughs> but to understand the de facto bans, you know, this is related to a noise ordinance. And in the first slide, those white spots are where you can build with a 50 decibel ordinance, and then it gets progressively smaller. And you see by the third slide, there's literally nowhere that you can, you can build. It makes projects impossible. And another common example is setbacks. This does sort of the opposite. The, the dots are where you can build. And as you increase the setbacks, almost nowhere. Uh, and so if you have those de facto bans, you're getting, getting things out of balance. And that's where you get state laws bypassing local laws. Um, and there are a number of different ways that that has happened. I, I wanted to just highlight one that, that kind of 
came up while I was preparing for this in the Iowa legislature. Uh, there was a gas station ban preemption. And you're like, what, what does gas station ban preemption have to do with this conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, the local anti-wind folks were some of the most opposed to this gas station ban the way it was written because it was a ban on de facto bans. Uh, and they were, they were concerned that it would impact their, their tactics. Um, and so I thought that was, that was a, a pretty interesting piece of this, but that's part of, I think, what at the high level we should be looking to avoid. I, I wanted to talk real quickly about principle about landowners uh, being decision makers in this process. Uh, and that's, I think, a key piece of the discussion here. You know, I don't know of a single project in Iowa. I can't speak to every project across the country, but I think all of these renewable projects are voluntary projects. Uh, so no eminent domain is used for something that is a key piece of critical infrastructure. That is really unusual. I mean, when you think about a highway uh, transmission line, those projects can't be built without some element of eminent domain. These projects are all being built because you have voluntary folks who enter into a contract who feel like they've been treated fairly, who get something out of this. One of the key pieces that, that also wasn't talked about from a rural way of life, I, you know, rural America has been changing over time and become larger and larger and push out small farms in a lot of cases. Wind, wind and solar projects have actually been a lifeline in a number of cases. The ability for a farmer to diversify uh, and add that revenue from a wind and solar perspective, you can't do that without, uh, in, in, in a lot of instances. And that allows a smaller scale farm to still exist, to use a portion of that land for wind and solar. Uh, and that piece of property rights is, is a pretty important piece. Uh, anecdotally, I'll tell another story since I'm in Iowa and I have these. I've got a neighbor who lives in Des Moines, but grew up on, on the farm. They actually have wind turbines and that's what allowed, uh, allowed them to, you know, the next generation moved away. Those wind turbines are the retirement security uh, for his father uh, and allows him to be able to live on the farm. The other interesting story related to that particular project uh, is it was outside of a small town. The small town actually annexed the land that the wind turbines were on to incorporate that into city limits because they wanted the tax benefits that were associated with that project because that would help make investments in the community that they very tangibly saw. Um, the other piece that this principle just sort of a best practice. This gets back to um, if you have some level of regulation, if you give property owners the ability to opt out or waive requirements, such as setback requirements, the impacted property owners, that should be a piece of this conversation too. Um, and that gives agency to property owners. Uh, and then I wanted to give attention to the, this key piece about quality of life. I, I think we should we should talk about projects being designed to reasonably protect health, safety, welfare, and quality of life. Um, and what that means, you know, it means you can take steps to uh, address those red lights. We have technology to solve that. That can be reflected. Uh, you know, when Eric was talking about their engineering design that can address some of the noise and shadow flicker issues, that can be accounted for. But what it doesn't mean is that you regulate to avoid preventing any change in the landscape or preventing any tech technology. And, and that's again, that balancing piece that I think is, is really important. Rural, rural landscapes are dynamic landscapes and always have been. Uh, and so the goal to prevent change shouldn't be, shouldn't be sort of the way that, that the law is used or weaponized. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to just touch on transparency. And I think transparency is important. It's critical to engage communities so that they have input into a project uh, and the potential for uh, input as it's being designed. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean a veto over a project and uh, transparency should be reasonable as well. And, and there's more that can be done to have uh, 
community engagement outside of the zoning or regulatory process, public meetings where people can come provide input, can identify maybe sensitive areas in a, in a county, uh, can engage and share their concerns. Uh, and I think there's been research that have shown that developers are willing to engage in that way and that projects can benefit from that. So those are some of the principles. I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it at that and appreciate being Thank included you. as part yeah. of this. We have, a, we have a politician on the panel. Oh, okay. yeah, we cover all bases with our commenters. Yeah. Over to you. Chris. Yo, Eric, if you want to steam out of the room before Department of Agriculture, you're <laughs> <laughs> get the clock for you. Um, we are buddies because uh, Department of Agriculture and, and Energy are right across the street from each other on 12th Street. Yeah. Um, Pre-pandemic, we used to like go over to each other's cafeterias and decide who had the better cafeteria. <laughs> but, um, and Josh, um, your former boss is my current boss, Secretary Bill Sack, and Secretary Bill Sack very much uh, is in sync with a lot of things that you were saying about um, creating new sources of income for farm families through renewable energy. And um, Dino Choa, thank you for your article. The what I found so compelling was was the human factor of this because um, you could have written the same article about what's going on in solar bio digesters uh hydro projects uh trash to energy projects uh you know and i think there's a good amount of research that could be done as to why this has cropped up recently because uh so just just anecdotally something that i have seen end up and those human stories are heartbreaking. It's dividing families. People are being effectively excommunicated from their churches because of what side they're on. And, and, it's, and, and um, the slides I wanna share with you kind of gives you a context of why I'm so worried about this. Um, and things that we're trying to do uh, at the Department of Agriculture to be able to address uh, some of these issues. Um, so I think I have some slides here, maybe. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, let me let me make a couple of points. Maybe we can pick, figure out where the slides are. Um, things that we're doing, um, uh, and what I'll talk about is, is some of the investments we're making under the Inflation Reduction Act. And as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we are requiring community benefit planning. And uh, that is an, that includes an engagement with the community and, and, and an expression of what the benefits are outside of the particular projects. And Secretary Vilsack, in particular, is interested in farmer benefit planning to be able to show how we can use renewable power, clean energy to be able to increase uh, farm income. Uh, the other thing about a federal federal funded project, it has to go through environmental review. Both both NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act review, which is uh, and, and and Fish and Wildlife um, review under the um, Endangered Species Act and Section 106, um, Historic Preservation Act uh, reviews. Those reviews can get very, very complicated and uh, long take a long time and, and sometimes frustrating for those of us who want to build projects and finance projects. Um, but they do have an element of public engagement in it, which is very, very important, including um, consideration protecting prime farmland. Um, and then cooperative uh, leadership is uh, something that uh, our agency, we work a lot with rural electric cooperatives. Um, the cooperative business structure is something that is unique. And uh, I encourage the students in, in the audience to study the cooperative business structure because it's a consumer owned entity. There right, you go. We finally have your slide. We found my slide. Sorry so about I'll, that. I'll and get if to you that. could speak up just a tad. For okay, a well, I will. I, thank you very much. I'll go find. I'm Christopher McLean. I'm the assistant minister. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I want to talk a little bit, put a little context about what we do. The Rural Utility Service is the successor agency to the Rural Electrification Administration. We begin our ori origin story here in deference to the good people of Vanderbilt yep. by starting with 1933 with the Tennessee Valley Authority Act. Um, and, um, and my administrator, the uh, political appointee who runs our agency is from Tennessee. Um, Andy Burke, the former mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So he's a, a very, uh, actually famous in clean energy development because Chattanooga had a, an electric uh, 
the municipal electric system, as well as broadband deployment in municip municipalities. And the other thing is that fellow there with the bow tie, that's George Norris. He was the author of the Tennessee Valley Act. And the Tennessee Valley Act was the inspiration for the Rural Electrification Act, which he authored in 1935. He was a Republican who supported Franklin Roosevelt during the New Deal uh, from the great state of Nebraska. And uh, so uh, President Roosevelt created Rural Electrification Act in 1935. In 1936, the Congress enacted the Rural Electrification Act. President Truman, 1949, uh, created the uh, signed into law the amendments that expanded our jurisdiction to telecommunications. And then uh, we also uh, finance water. So the latest chapter in our uh, origin story here is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Go to the next slide there. That's fine. Um, and uh, it is the Inflation Reduction Act, which for us is the greatest investment in rural electrification since the New Deal. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of legislation. Move to the next slide. Um, again, here's what RUS does, electric, telecom, water, um, and broadband. Um, so again, our, our roots are in the New Deal. I also encourage everybody to look at the New Deal for inspiration. Um, if you want to talk about changing man-made climate change, look at the dust bowl. Poor farming habits, uh, overgrazing, uh, lack of science, uh, lack of crop rotation. And how did that get solved? It was with man-made science. Science from the Department of Agriculture uh, and the Extension Service and education and the same challenge is the same thing. And when we were rolling out um, electricity in 1935 to rural areas, 10% of American farmers had electricity. And there was a lot of fear about electricity. We used to, uh, the REA used to have tent shows to go to communities to be able to say well, how electricity is safe. Um, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna make your cows produce less milk. It's not gonna electrocute you. Um, but it was also one of the greatest uh, economic engines for rural America. Um, rural America in the 1930s was as about third, as third world as you could imagine, right? And, for women, there was like no movement in rural America that was more important than rural electrification because it was an absolute liberation from the drudgery of having to haul water to cook with, uh, with, uh, with coal or wood. And, um, and anyway, I, I digress, but anyway, let's go next to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, why we're so excited about it. And it is this huge investment. My agency or rural development, rural development is part of three agencies. I'm, I'm a one third of that rural utility service. Uh, Congress gave us $1 billion for partially forgivable loans for clean energy investments. And those, in, those partial forgiveness will be at uh, rates of 20% forgiveness, 40% forgiveness, and 60% forgiveness, depending on the communities you serve. So if you're in an energy dependent community or a um, disadvantaged community, you could get to 40%. If you're a tribal community, um, or, uh, or a, uh, one, of, one of the territories, you can get up to 60% um, loan forgiveness. And then Congress gave us $9.7 billion uh, for clean energy loans and grants uh, with 25% of the, of the uh, amount being limited to grants. So that $9.7 billion are, will leverage billions of dollars of more investment. Uh, our sister agency and, and uh, uh, Dina Cho mentioned it in her article, the Rural Energy for America program is a uh, program for, for farm operators and for rural businesses to invest in energy efficiency and renewable power to be able to reduce their costs. Uh, Congress took that program uh, way, way up in funding for $1.05 billion in the REAP program. It's a tremendous program. So uh, if you think of what we do at Rural Utility Service, we're kind of on the wholesale side, financing electric infrastructure and renewable and energy efficiency. And REAP is kind of on the retail side, uh, the, cons the consumer um, and uh, rural business areas. The other thing is there, this is really important, direct pay tax credits for the first time for co-ops, municipalities, and nonprofits. Another tremendous opportunity to address some of those issues that were raised because those tax benefits, instead of going to greedy developers who want to, you know, and the Wall Street investors, can go to communities, to cooperatives, and really uh, make this power 
extremely affordable, and there were consumer tax credits in uh, for a host of energy efficiency measures. And uh, uh, other federal agencies like the Department of Energy and the EPA also have um, energy uh, benefits as well. We'll go to the next slide. So PACE, what, what we, we um, opened our uh, applicant funding application window in, Septem uh, in um, September and we closed it in December. So both of these programs, I'm gonna talk about PACE and New Era, um, our, they are closed right now and we are dealing with those applications. When we started to roll out this program uh, in the summer of last year, you know, at the very beginning, I would say, let's say the fall of 22, soon after the, soon after the IRA passed, there was a lot of skepticism, you know, particularly from the biggest carbon producing cooperatives. Like, nah, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not sure if this is for us. We got, we got to worry about reliability. Um, those of you in Tennessee, you know, we were fresh off of Winter Storm Elliott, which for the first time had the TVA have brownouts across its service territory. And the previous years, uh, we had the uh, Winter Storm uh, Uri in Texas, which, which cost, which people died because they lost electricity. And consumers are going to be paying for years for the cost of that power. So this, this concern about electric reliability is a really big deal for utilities uh, because not only for rural utilities who have uh, some limited resources and, and have the most difficult to serve communities, they also have growing demand because that's the other thing that's happening with energy uh, consumption. For many years, we were kind of plateaued as energy efficiency went into place. Now, we're just, and now we're coming out of COVID, we're just going up in demand for um, energy use. Uh, things like beneficial electrification, right? The electrification of the transportation segment. Uh, data centers. Data centers are huge consumers of electricity, and a lot of them are being located in rural areas. So anyway, as we went through the, the summer promoting these two programs, and, you know, say, hey, look, we got these tax credits. Uh, we're going to have forgivable loans. Um, and uh, in the other program, we're going to have 25% grant support. You could feel the earth move as we would go um, through, it just changed through the summer. And as a result, um, in fact, when we first got this program, we're thinking, well, you know, maybe we're gonna have to do this in tranches. Maybe we're, maybe, maybe we don't even have to worry about scoring because we're not gonna get enough applications to be able to um, use this money. We got 300 letters of interest for the Power and Affordable uh, Clean Energy Program, a billion dollar program, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of stopped counting at like 12 times the amount of interest. So you know, again, the tragedy of this is we're not gonna be able to fund really good projects that are in the queue. The next one is the new era, that's the $9.7 billion, statutorily focused exclusively on rural electric cooperatives, right? So uh, in the uh, next one, the, the, the next one, which is the new era program, the new empowering rural America, we got over um, 160 letters of interest. So that $9.7 billion, uh, the interest was at least four times as great as the money that we had to offer, all right? And again, that $9.7 billion in budget wonk um, talk is budget authority that will leverage up into investments of, again, several multiples of that. So, and uh, so we are actually, we, we, we announced, Secretary Vilsack just announced the first five PACE awards. We are now moving um, to process the new era applications. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. And then read. Uh, that was, again, that was the program mentioned uh, about rural business cooperative service. Here's the important thing about REAP. $1.6 billion in grants and loans since the start of the Biden-Harris um, administration. Uh, there is $800 million available until 2025. Uh, they're going to roll out $200 million per year from 25 to 27. The REAP application cycle is a quarterly cycle. So there's money available and money. And so if you, if you apply for that program and you don't get it, you can um, try, it, try it again. There's a set aside for $144 million for underutilized technologies. Well, what does that mean? Well, right now it means anything but solar. 
because that and and so that there's a wind opportunity, there's a hydro opportunity, there's a biomass opportunity um, to be underutilized technology set aside in the REAP program. So we'll go to the next slide. And um, for anyone who wants to get into the technical assistance business of trying to help folks apply for REAP, we have an open competition right now. The application window is from March 15th to May 15th, uh, with awards being expected to make made this summer. And uh, it's uh, per state, there's about between, in, in most states, between $250,000 and $500,000 available for technical assistance to help farmers and uh, rural businesses adopt uh, clean energy technologies and energy efficiency. And I'll just give you the next slide, I'm keeping eye on the, the clock. So that's what we have from the Inflation Reduction Act. Our Rural Electrification Act activity uh, is, is pretty robust. Uh, we finance everything that a rural utility would need, um, whether it's infrastructure, project financing. Uh, we have a small high energy cost grant program, which typically goes to places like Alaska. We can make operating loans, we can make smart grid uh, loans, uh, and we even provide financing to others who finance rural electric utilities. And then we have a, a, an energy efficiency program. We'll lend money at 0% interest to a utility to relend to their consumers for energy efficiency, and the consumer pays back the utility through on-bill financing, and they pay, the utility pays cool. us back. And that can include on-grid, off-grid, renewable energy. We'll go next slide. And kind of to give it a scale of our, our level of investment, uh, last year, last fiscal year, uh, we invested um, um, $6.88 billion in rural electric infrastructure. So you can see that for me, I, I started, uh, I came back to the agency in 2015. So for me, it's a personal best. <laughs> but, but, um, but that kind of investment, and this is loan only investment, usually at treasury rates of interest. And Electric infrastructure, the electric grid is the most complicated, most complicated machine known to humankind, right? Just think about how panicked you get when your cell phone runs out of power. I mean, but, but the grid always has to be in balance. The grid has to deliver power when it's needed. And the grid is changing from a single directional, from the power plant to the transmission line, to the distribution line, to your home, to multi-directional. Where, where power is going all ways and data has to move with that power. So there's a huge need, especially in rural America to invest in infrastructure. And we're, 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 we're trying to meet that need. Um, we we'll go to the next slide. And um, so we're, we're very proud of the co-op business model. We'll go to the next slide. Um, co-ops are an important part of rural America. Co-ops again, Consumer-owned organization. So when a co-op invests in wind, solar, biomass, whatever, the co-op members, which are the members of that community, also benefit from it. The profits go to them, or the margins. They're not profits because they're non-taxable um, mm -hmm. business organizations. You go to the next slide. Um, but we do business not just with, we're most famous for our work with cooperatives, uh, but we, we will work with um, investor-owned utilities, municipal utilities, developers, tribal utilities, and energy efficiency entities. So I, the next one, I think we're, oh, he just kind of, kind of th closing um, thoughts. So the overwhelming response to our two IRA um, programs uh, shows that there is a lot of rural imagination and excitement and anticipation of a clean energy future. The reason rural America has a hard time of making this transition, it's frankly economic. If you've got a coal plant, I mean, how many, how many of you are driving a brand new car, right? You drive a car until it kind of wears out. People have these 50 year assets that, that, you know, they're working, I've got them paid off. What do you mean I got to close it down, right? And how am I going to afford it? You know, there's, again, before those tax credits, yeah, a big investor on utility, they can write it off, they can deduct it from their taxes. Co-ops can't do that. Municipals can't do it. Municipals can only rely on the, on the tax base of their, of their citizens. So those tax benefits in the IRA are gonna be a major um, improvement. There is, but but we, if we get those incentives right, we get the excitement, we get the anticipation, we get the, we get the visions of economic development. Um, 
The sad thing for me, I'm as, as thrilled as I am with this overwhelming response and, and the work that it presents our agency, but um, there's going to be a lot of projects that are really good that I'm just going to run out of money for. I mean, I could use another $9.7 billion and another billion dollars. I could use years of billions of dollars to be able to keep on going through that list. Um, rural America all, already spends more on the disposable income on power than anyone else, right? So when you are dealing with these issues, you've got to think about that. And the value proposition has to be affordable energy, that this is really going to be cheap power. Um, the infrastructure is aging, and they have growing demand. And um, you know, without these kinds of incentives, so compared to the nudge, this is the magnet, right? Yeah. With, with, without these kind of incentives, that transition to a clean energy future would be extremely, extremely difficult. So I'm, this is my life. That's it. Sorry about that. No, no, it's but wonderful. That, that's it. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. It is. The breadth of what we all are doing is, is really impressive. Um, okay, so we had such an amazing panel that had so much to say that we are a little bit over right now. Um, I want to give the authors a chance to respond, and I'm going to suggest that we just do questions informally over the lunch break so we can reconvene around one for the webinar participants. So I saw you guys writing a lot. So <laughs> maybe just like three to five minutes of response would be wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give reactions first, and Hannah, if she's got additional ones, um, we'll, we'll fill in. So I want to just start by saying I think everyone here is on board with the transition to clean energy, and I, and yeah. I, I absolutely recognize and agree that the um, that these conversations often get uh, you know sort of tense when there is any sort of discordant uh, information. In, uh, in, in the conversation. And frankly, the, the purpose of this project is to elevate the voices of those who are in discord um, because we believe that that discord is prohibiting the rapid transition to renewable energy. And so by elevating those voices and seeing them and giving them full cognizance, we can try to then address the substance of what is at the heart of that emotion. Some of it is irrational. So, um, for example, the question about property values. We recognize that um, that in communities where uh, wind turbines have been established, that there is generally decent sentiment, and therefore the property values are, you know, sort of non uh, or negligible effects. In places, however, where wind farms have been rejected, there is significant reason to pay attention to why that is, so that we can try to make breakthroughs. As again. You know, we talked about uh, the impasses. Um, it, the article does focus a, a good bit on the negative, and it does that because that's what we found when we went looking. Um, and that is incredibly important. And we wanted particularly to give real um, space for the reasons that there is negative uh, perception and negative uh, 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 sort of reaction that is having real, real policy implications in our ability to transition to renewable energy. Um, so we, you know, fundamentally we agree there needs to be a better balance of the benefits being paid here, taking cognizance of the fact that there's very small margins. However, these are profitable enterprises and we are working toward a public imperative. So we might need to rethink what the balance is and how just exactly how much of the margin should be in the in, in the hands of, of, of the rural communities, because fundamentally, I agree, this is a financial uh, question, and um, many of the, the emotional reactions can be incentivized through financial, uh, through, uh, sorry, through emotional reactions can be well through financial incentives. Um, I, I agree entirely that there is a lot of risk in these uh, in these investments, a lot of risk, a lot of time goes in, into planning. And one of the reactions we heard is that, you know, we should not inform or we might be cautious about informing the communities early and often and transparently about um, about the projects that are underway, because that might impede the ability to actually push them through. Um, but I would again urge caution if what we're doing is hiding under, you know, hiding processes under shadows. Um, that raises distrust. And we have seen that it is resulting, we have lot, ample evidence now that it's resulting in communities saying no. And that's 
that that we think is fundamentally a, a real challenge to our ability to transition quickly to renewable energy. So um, I love I, again, I love the idea of, of, of trying to rebalance the. I, I, actually, I should say to Josh, I love the idea of, of trying to rebalance the um, the power. Uh, uh, not only the power of uh, the power of, of the companies, but also the amount of power that the community um, ordinance boards and community commissions have. That they do have a, a really large amount of power, and it is having this effect of distorting elections, distorting politics in rural communities that is disturbing beyond the concerns that we express here. Um, and I, I, I want to just, um, you know, really, really thank all of the commentators. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I think that the, um, the Josh, your, your slides on the, the effect of um, of regulations and how they they result in de facto bans is really those were fabulous slides, and I'm super grateful. It's really hard to um, to visualize how those de facto bans uh, come to be, and so that was really, really helpful. And um, uh, um, uh, Chris McLean, thank you too. I, you know, we. The article, you, know, you stop doing your research and you publish the article, and then the world keeps moving. And so the updates on the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the work that your yeah. office is doing are really, really important because so much really of the of the, um, the the problems we saw, we believe can be overcome through better process and and more um, attractive substance in in the deals. And so yeah. the the um, the financial incentives are incredibly helpful, and we think that they will they will be really beneficial. Um, I couldn't say that any better. I echo those sentiments wholeheartedly. So I think we can go ahead and break our lunch. <laughs> yeah, I, this is just been, a, soul this has been <laughs> a wonderful panel, and I just wish we had more time. But thank you so much. Yeah. What we're going to do is take a break and start back up at about five minutes after. If you need more time, I understand, but I'm mindful of the next panel schedule, and I just don't, you know, uh, want to run over too much. But um, I'm sure that these folks will stay up here for questions. And please go grab a lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I
Uh, now to introduce our distinguished author and panelist, uh, Professor Dave Owen to my left is the Associate Dean for Research and the Harry D. Sunderland Professor of Law at the University of California College of the Law, San Francisco, which he joined in 2015 after beginning his academic career at the University of Maine. Prior to joining the Legal Academy, Professor Owen clerked for Judge Samuel Conti of the United States District Court for the Northern District of California and worked for a small law firm in San Francisco where his practice focused primarily on water law. Following a career as an environmental consultant after graduating from Amherst College, Professor Owen decided to go back to law school to become an environmental lawyer, graduating uh, or from the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Uh, Carl Brook is a senior attorney and director of international programs at the Environmental Law Institute, helping countries develop and implement laws, policies, and institutional frameworks to effectively manage water resources, biodiversity, forests, and other natural resources. Prior to joining ELI, Mr. Bruce worked as an attorney with the United Nations Environment Program and the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide. Uh, Mr. Bruce received his JD from the Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College, his master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin, and his undergraduate degree from Michigan State University. John Cruden is a principal at Beverage and Diamond in its Washington office, where he provides strategic counsel on high stakes environmental and natural resources litigation civil and criminal enforcement, and compliance matters. Prior to joining Beverage and Diamond, Mr. Cruden served as a senior leader on environment and natural resources matters at the U.S. Department of Justice for more than 20 years, including as the assistant attorney for the Environment and Natural Resources Division from 2015 to 2017. During his time at DOJ, Mr. Cruden personally negotiated the multi-billion dollar resolution of both the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Mr. Cruden received his JD from Santa Clara University his master's degree from the University of Virginia, and his undergraduate degree from the United States Military Academy. Ben Grumbles serves as the executive director of the Environmental Council of the States. Prior to his current role, Mr. Grumbles was Secretary of the Environment for Maryland from 2015 to 2022, and serving as chair of the Governor's Chesapeake Bay Cabinet and the Re Maryland Climate Change Commission, as well as an executive committee member of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, Mr. Grumbles has also served as the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Assistant Administrator for Water, as well as Senior Staff and Counsel for the Transportation and Infrastructure and Science Committees in the U.S. Congress. Mr. Grumbles received his LLM in Environmental Law from George Washington University, his JD from the Emory University School of Law, and his undergraduate degree from Wake Forest University. Finally, uh, Vicki Patton serves as the Environmental Defense Fund's General Counsel and leads its U.S. Clean Air Program. Prior to joining EDF, Ms. Patton served in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of General Counsel, where she implemented the historic 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and received the Gold Medal for Exceptional Service. Ms. Patton received her JD from the New York University School of Law and her undergraduate degree from the University of Arizona. Thank you, Michael. And um, just an amazing panel. Yep. Some of the biggest leaders in environmental law. It's just really wonderful to have you all here. And um, Dave, I think that we picked your article many years ago when you were a fairly new professor. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. saw it uh, early on. We saw your promise early on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, kind of the rest. And yeah, then I, nothing in between. Just remember. <laughs> there's a, there's a dip. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you back and over to you. <laughs> all right. So, um, Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the Vanderbilt students who've really been wonderful to work with so far. Um, I am still sort of awestruck at who else I'm sitting on stage with. So that's really exciting as well. Thank you all for joining me and, and for you for being here. So I'm going to give you an overview of the article. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking about some of the conventional views to which the article responds. And then I'll talk about how I did the research for this article, what I found, uh, and what I think the implications are with, with a focus on potential policy reforms. And I should say at the outset that this is an article that deliberately paints with a, a broad brush. Um, there are, it gets into some details in, in more in the, the long form version, not in the short form version um, about the implementation of specific programs. But the generalizations are generalizations. And I know that every single one of them has lots of exceptions. I'll allude to some of those, but I just want to put that caveat out there at the outset. Okay. Oops. Oh, this doesn't seem to be advancing. Uh, but at least we're getting a moment of peacefulness staring at that beautiful okay. landscape. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. What did you do? I clicked on the, I clicked on the screen. Okay, so it's going to work now. Great. Thank you. Um, 
All right, so well, let's start with some conventional views. Uh, and these are really the views that I think I was taught when I was a law student and that some, of, to some degree I continue to believe as a practicing attorney. And it was only once I started doing research that I started to think maybe this isn't so accurate, at least so complete. So one classic view, we often hear the term command and control. Uh, and the view that goes with this, I think is, is captured fairly well by the two quotes we see here. The basic idea is that environmental law is centralized, it is rigid, it lacks flexibility, and it is often implemented by people who don't know very much, uh, at least at the federal level, about the programs or the people that they are affecting. So that's one. Another conventional view is what I will call the slippage view. And in this view, environmental law is supposed to be rigid and inflexible, but in fact, it's not, because whenever the rubber hits the road, the agencies just kind of negotiate away the storm. So in one of these views, there's a lot of negotiation in the slippage view, but it's really problematic. And here, I'll give you a couple of quotes that capture that. One is from an author named Mary Wood, a professor at Oregon. Um, this other view comes from Dan Farber in what actually I think is a very nuanced article. It's one of my favorite environmental law articles. But this quote kind of captures the sense that we have this relatively rigid law in the books, and that would be a good thing, but we don't live up to it. And, and really, you know, they're... Again, these are somewhat caricatured views at the endpoints of a spectrum, but I think they are also highly influential. And more specifically, they're influential in the ways that we think about reforming environmental law. Um, so in one view, again, we don't have a whole lot of negotiating, we don't have a lot of flexibility, and there's a problem. And the ways to solve that problem would be to use markets or devolution to state and local governments or the private sector to introduce the flexibility that should be there and is lacking. And then in the other view, it's supposed to be rigid. We give the rigidity away. And so reform basically means adding more backbone to what agencies do by giving them less flexibility, less ability to negotiate. Either way, the common thread is environmental law is a mess. It's, a big, it's got big problems and we need some reforms to fix them. So my interest in this article, and it builds on other previous articles, including the one that, that, that I presented here about 10 years ago, um, was to get a sense of what's really going on out there on the ground. And more specifically, where there is flexibility, where there is negotiation in the implementation of environmental law. And to some degree, you can find out about that through researching paper documents. But those will tend to lead you to a few very high profile, high stakes, large scale examples of negotiation at a few limited sectors. And I wanted to get beyond that and find out how, what's going on in the day-to-day -day grind of environmental law litigation. And it turns out that the way to do that, the only way I could think of to do that was to do interviews and to actually talk to people. So the core of the research for this article was a series of, of research interviews, semi-structured interviews with environmental lawyers in the private sector, on the government side, uh, in NGOs, um, and to try to get a sense of what was negotiable, what was not negotiable, and how that figured into the work that they did on a routine basis. I focused on uh, a set of subject matter areas that I think most of us would conventionally think of as the core of traditional environmental law. So waste site cleanup, endangered species protection, Clean Air Act implementation, Clean Water Act implementation, uh, and then environmental impact assessment, both under federal law and under uh, some state laws. Uh, and also look to some degree at enforcement, which cuts across these areas. So what did I find? This is a very busy slide. We don't expect you to take it all in. The basic point here is that in all of the subject areas I looked at, there is a lot of negotiation. And there's negotiation often in areas that we don't think of traditionally as being negotiable. And it is routine. It is not sort of a, a, an outlier that happens only occasionally. Not everything is negotiable. So an interesting detail is that in a lot of these subject areas, there might be one type of permit that involves negotiations and another type of permit that does not. So it's not like everything out there is negotiable, but many, many things are. Um, and this next slide is just a sampling of some of the quotes. Oops. Uh-oh, get rid of that, uh, of some of the quotes from the attorneys and other practitioners who I talked to. Uh, and again, the theme was that this is central to what they do. 
that this is not something that's an occasional outlier or that is limited to enforcement attorneys. Um, and then to, to get a little more detailed, what's being negotiated? Uh, in general, it's a couple of different things. One is the project itself. Um, so we just heard about wind projects, and we know that when somebody is doing a wind project, very often the nature of the project, where it is going to be located, what its boundaries are going to be, how many turbines there are going to be, that is all subject to negotiation before regulators. And that's true more generally. It is not limited to wind projects. It's true for all kinds of projects that are subject to review, where the project itself is up for discussion. Mitigation measures are another significant area of negotiation under many, not all, but many of the environmental review programs that we have out there. What information will be the basis for decisions? In other words, what's essentially in the, the, the factual record that people will rely on to decide, and then also what it means. And this was an interesting one. A lot of agency staff would say, you know, we don't really negotiate over what the facts are or what the science says. That's not negotiable. And then I would say that to the practicing attorneys on the other side, and they just start laughing. And you're like, oh, of course, that's what you're negotiating. You can't negotiate mitigation without negotiating about what the impacts are. Um, and then finally, sometimes what counts as compliance is negotiable um, because often the standards in governing law are stated in general or qualitative terms, or there is some flexibility built in with things like variances so we have to negotiate to determine not just what the project will be or how we will assess that project, but what will the law be that governs that project. So again, these are, these are subjects that really go to the core of what we are doing with a lot of environmental regulation. Okay, so why does this matter? Uh, I'm gonna start out with implications for some of our convention reviews. Um, and I think this undercuts, partially undercuts both of these views. So with the, the command and control view, again, the basic idea is environmental law is really rigid and inflexible. That's a problem. And we need to fix that by getting authority out from the center to the periphery, whether through markets or devolution or both. And I think my finding partially undercuts that and partially undercuts that because we already are much more decentralized. We already have a lot more communication. Negotiation is communication. Um, then I think a lot of the proponents of this conventional view realize. Then with the slippage critique, the idea here is that environmental law should be rigid and negotiation is giving away the slow. Um, so I think there's absolutely no doubt that this stuff happens sometimes. But I think what that critique misses is that sometimes negotiation plays more of a constitutive role in helping us figure out what the law is. And it also misses that it's often both sides that give. It's not just the regulators who are giving ground, but also project proponents are often making adjustments to minimize the impacts of the projects that they are proposing. And that's meaningful and that's valuable. Okay, so all of this makes negotiating in the environmental regulatory sphere sound really kind of good. Um, but I also discovered problems or documented problems through the study. And I'll just briefly go through some of those and then through some potential fixes. So one huge issue is transparency. Something that was very consistent was that there was very minimal documentation, both at a general level about what is negotiable and how the negotiations are supposed to work. And then also at a more specific level of where negotiations had happened, what had been negotiated, what, how had been the movement of positions, or how the movement of positions occurred during that negotiation. So it's very much a black box. And to some degree, that's, you know, that's why I was interviewing people instead of doing research on paper for this project. That's kind of a weird way to be finding out about something that is so central to environmental law. Second big issue is effectiveness. There is, was widespread agreement among the people I talked to that government regulators, with prominent exceptions, but that government regulators on the whole are not great at doing the negotiating part of their jobs. Um, and I've got a couple of quotes that I think capture this. Um, both of these happen to pertain to the Fish and Wildlife Service, which was a, a particularly recurring target of vitriol, but um, they, they came from other, about other agencies as well. Um, I should say not as much about the uh, DOJ. I did not hear it as much there um, and less about EPA, but I think we have to remember that all of these regulatory programs to a large degree are implemented even at the federal level, often by field staff, 
and if it's not at the federal level, by state agencies. Uh, and so that's where the, the real rubber hits the road and that's where the real challenges are. Uh, so here's another quote, again, about the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I heard similar things about the, the negotiators who are negotiating air quality permits, that we have people who are totally overwhelmed by the people on the other side of the table, are inexperienced. One air quality attorney told me, yeah, we train them. Like we actually train the government regulators on the other side, like they're eager and they, they really wanna do a good job, but they have no idea what they're doing. And so we have to explain to them how to be negotiators. And then the last three words here are the consistent answer I got almost every time I asked a government employee, how did you learn to do these environmental negotiations? <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it was very, very consistent. So a third issue is equity. Um, what I've described here is a system where it's complicated, there are intricate rules of the game and they are not documented and often it takes a lot of time. You put all of those things together and you're going to have a system that is very inaccessible to disadvantaged communities, to smaller businesses, to a lot of people who don't have fancy lawyers, fancy consultants. And again, I think this quote uh, from somebody EPA describing a super fund negotiation captures what's going on and what we're concerned about. Okay, so what do we do about this? And I've got, again, a couple recommendations, each stated at a fairly general level, but I hopefully can get a little bit into the details as well. So one suggestion the article makes is better documentation. And I realize at first glance that may sound really bland and cliche. So let me be a little bit more specific about what I mean by that. There is an Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation handbook that is the Bible for doing Section 7 consultations. It says nothing about negotiations, even though negotiations are central to Section 7 processes. There is another Bible for habitat conservation plan development. Everybody knows that HCP is involved in negotiations, but you wouldn't know it from reading the HCP handbook. The NPDES permit writer's guide says nothing about negotiating variances or compliance timetables or any of the other important things that get negotiated as part of permit writing. And there is similar silence in the guidance documents that EPA produces on writing air quality permits. The exception that I found is Superfund. In Superfund, we talk openly about the roles of negotiation. It's pretty well acknowledged, but that's an outlier. In all of these other areas, there are documents that really govern how people do the work, and they don't tell them anything about how they might have to negotiate or how they should do it, or tell third parties, here's what to bring to the negotiations to make them successful. Um, relatedly, it would be nice to have more information about the outcomes of negotiations as well, so that, you know, in, in a perfect world, we might have a sort of red fin for the administrative state where you, you have some sense what the other people's deals were and how they were struck, so you can get to yes much more efficiently. Uh, training. Again, a recurring theme, not about every agency, but about many of the agencies I talked to was a lack of training. And I should also say, I have never heard so much enthusiasm expressed anywhere in my life for continuing education. You know, when I asked people about continuing ed programs they did for negotiation, oh, it was wonderful, it was amazing. No one says that in this world about continuing ed, <laughs> but these government employees did. And I also think it is on us as educators. I do not think we do enough in law school to train people within the environmental sphere to go into these negotiation settings and succeed. And we're way better than the engineering programs and the environmental science programs that are sending the biologists and the engineers out to the agencies that at the state level will actually do the negotiations often without any lawyers involved. I'm guessing many of those people have no idea until they get into that situation that this was going to be part of their career and their job. Uh, and then finally, more resources to support community participation. This is not at all an original suggestion. This is something many other people have been writing about for years in greater depth. But I think this is another illustration of why it is important to have things like intervener funding. And of course, just at a basic level, better documentation so people have a, a better idea of what's going on. And then finally, at a much broader level, I think there's a value to just Accurate, accurately describing the state of the world and understanding what's going on out there. Uh, and I think that requires us, particularly those of us who are academics or high level policy people thinking about how environmental law works, just to acknowledge how central these negotiations are to the field. So again, thank you very much for including me. I look forward Wonderful. to hearing the comments.
you can you can tell that your article really resonated with people by who did turn up to comment. Um, I am going to remind everyone, although you are all phenomenal experts, ten minutes each, so we can have some Q and A would be wonderful. So, thank you. Um, I very much enjoyed your article. Um, I thought you did a great job of highlighting the complexity of the practice. And you took it from practitioner perspective, which is too rare in the literature. Come back to both of those points. I think that this complexity of practice reflects the underlying complexity and complications. The, the, there's a the, the complicated aspect of environmental law is there are all these different factors. The complexity is all the different feedback loops in the down in the area, which means it's very hard to predict what's going to work. But we want certainty. We, we want to lock things in. And so I think that the this complexity in practice reflects the complexity of the environmental, the economic, and the social contexts, and the inability of the law to actually predict everything that's going to happen. And I think there are... Um, this requires both clear requirements and flexibility in how we achieve them for equity, for efficiency, and for effectiveness. And I think that you do a great job of saying, essentially, we need to lean, lean into the complexity. You need to say, yes, we need clear rules and firm framework, a, a skeleton, if you will, but we also need the flexibility the, to have it be relevant and applicable and efficient in these circumstances. And fundamentally, this is how the world is working. I mean, you know, we're sitting in ivory towers complaining about, you know, uh, all the flexibility that's happening. Well, put yourself in the shoes of the people who are there. What should they do specifically? Do we want automatons? I mean, should we just fire EPA and replace them with chatbot? You know, chat GPA, chat GPT. You know, the question is not. This is not obvious. There are all these extenuating circumstances. Um, I think my primary question, as I read through this, and I, it, it came out more clearly in the presentation than I saw in the article, was whether there are certain times or contexts when negotiation is more common or it's less common, and when should it be common. Um, and I think that you highlighted in the presentation you know, what the project is, mitigation measures, um, the info for decision making, and compliance, or what constitutes compliance. I think those are interesting points. I, I kind of take it back a step even more and say, you know, um, you know, okay, we'll often negotiate what the standards are. Some of it's because the science is unclear and we're getting, we're getting information from different places when we set the standards. <laughs> and so there's kind of this, this consultation and, and discussion around you know, what the standards should be. Um, and this happens to some extent in Congress and it happens to a large extent <clears throat> in the agencies. Um, I also think that there's a question of how do you weigh the different variables? And that's where I think Congress comes in. Sometimes they say, we care only about public health. Put the cost aside. You know, the, the statute is very clear. Other times you're supposed to do a cost benefit type analysis or consider technological feasibility, um, social dimensions. And so I think, you know, part of that is what the framework sets up and how much uh, um, negotiation is there. Um, I think another way of asking the question is, um, you know, when you say not everything in environmental law is negotiable, what's not negotiable? What should not be negotiable? And um, what constitutes acceptable boundaries for negotiation? And it strikes me that generally the objectives, once established, should not be negotiable. What we often negotiate are the means for achieving those objectives, that there may be more efficient more effective means, um, more equitable means, but it's the means that we often are compromising on. And in some cases, you know, the, the standards are based on certain technological te best available technology, but it doesn't say you have to use this technology. You can innovate other technologies. And so I, I think that 
we kind of starting to think about very fundamentally, what are we compromising? I think very clearly it should not be what the objectives are. Um, I, 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 there's one other example that came to mind as I was reading this from the uh, licensing and relicensing of hydropower dams. Mm -hmm. And these, these licenses often are 50 years. <clears throat> and, met, and we're not building many new dams. We are relicensing. So we already have seen the impacts of dams on an adrenaline fish and on ecosystems generally. What we don't know is how do we fix it other than removing the dam? And uh, so there's, uh, there we're seeing, uh, we saw this uh, in uh, it was the, um, the Clark Fork project, the uh, Lower Clark Fork River in Oregon, where the owner of the dam had gone through a relicensing process. There was a bitter fight. And they said, let's, we don't want to do this again. And they sat down with the different stakeholders and said, what would you like? They invited FERC. FERC's like, no, no, no. We, you know, we have our requirement. We have our role. They, they sat in the room. They did not comment. They were asked for comments. No, no, no. You know, we're going to reserve our um, regulatory authority. But in the end, they set up a process where they had clear, enforceable objectives, but the means for implementing that they try something. If it worked, they'd scale it up. If not, they try something else. But the thing is, you you, have, you lock in these decisions for 50 years in many cases. It might be th only 30 years. And you don't know what's going to happen. Climate change, the evolution of species and our knowledge of the ecosystem. And so I, I think that this is, you know, this this reign, this realm of adaptive management is one place where we do see a lot of negotiation about the means, less about the um, objectives. Um, I really liked your three uh, recommendations regarding transparency, effectiveness, and equity. Um, I think that there is, a, I think it's, it's important to step back and not view an agency as having a culture. Within an agency, there are often different offices with very different cultures on negotiation. You'll have the at EPA, you'll have the media offices, you'll have OECA, you'll have the Office of General Counsel, and they all have different objectives. And then you have the career staff vis-a-vis -vis the political staff, where you say, oh, you know, new, new political staff comes in, we want to work with these communities and advance their interests. And so the career staff try to you know, do that. And then Awika loves to, you know, the courts are um, unpredictable. Uh, and it takes a long time. And if you can get a settlement, a negotiated settlement, you know, you come in with a big hammer and then you negotiate. They love negotiations. And OGC is stuck there going, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, the law requires this. And so I think that there are, within a single agency, there are different views and cultures as it comes to negotiation. I think that's important to note. Um, I think that my concern with institutionalizing an emphasis on negotiation is the risk that it further marginalizes OGC. Already, OGC often is invited in only at the end to fix problems. And you know we, they don't want OGC there when they're negotiating because OGC says, wait a minute, that's not allowed by law. And that's not what the political desire is. And it doesn't matter what the administration is. This is a very common dynamic. And so and I think if we're able to do what you suggest, which is to clearly articulate what is negotiable and under what circumstances, I think that would be fantastic. I, I wouldn't fully support this. My concern is we lead into negotiation, but we kind of glide over that step. And that, that's just going to further empower um, those who want, especially the political leadership, who cater to the ideological constituencies. So I think there's a real question about how do you set these limits in a legal way rather than in a political way? Um, the, there are two questions that flow from that. One is, if results are negotiated, and they're negotiated on political re reasons more than technical reasons, is there a reason to defer to agency deference? What does this mean for Chevron? Second, um, what does negotiation mean for the environmental rule of law? Um, how do we understand that? And the, um, the final thing I'll just flag, I'll stop there, is I didn't see, maybe I missed it, 
but there wasn't much discussion about EPA's experience with Reg N, the negotiated regulations, which were very common in the 90s, and they faded off largely because of budgetary reasons. It was costly because OIRA really hated it. And they got um, litigated anyway. Right? And, <laughs> we and, and, they, they and, 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 and PACA's requirements about transparency. Yeah. And you know, it, there are all sorts of reasons, but I think that you know that was an effort to institutionalize negotiation mm -hmm. in the regulatory context. Um, but I, and I just close with a comment that I really liked your approach of finding out what's actually happening in the world and querying, are we understanding how environmental law is structured, how it should be structured from the perspective of what experience tells us? Thank you. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> but now the view from the trenches. <laughs> no ivory tower. Good to be back, Eli, uh, uh, there. And then those of you in the audience and those of you watching, I hope you know when you have people like Carl and Vicki Patton and Ben Grumbles, you'll really be seeing the best that we have. Uh, so this is a great honor and privilege to be sharing uh, uh, with them. And, and Dave, the fact that you're sitting here subjecting yourself to all of us talking about me <laughs> is, is another great statement about you. Um, although I'm teaching right now at George Washington University, I'm fundamentally a practitioner. Uh, by that, I mean I litigate. And if you litigate, you negotiate all the time uh, 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 there. So I, it, it's always interesting for me to read a law review article about what I do. Uh, uh, there because uh, uh, Dave describes this world where uh, there's a lot of rocks and enforcement is hiding underneath one of those rocks and lift up the rock. My God, everybody's negotiating. Uh, uh, and, and it reminds me of Casablanca from the movie Casablanca. Remember where, where the captain comes in to Rick's gambling casino and he goes, I'm so shocked, shocked uh, to find out that there's gambling here. Uh, uh, there was a little bit like that, a tone like that of the article. Like, I am so shocked to find out <laughs> that people are actually negotiating uh, 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 right now. But, but I get it in the sense uh, uh, that it isn't simple to research uh, what all of us are doing in negotiations. Your research tends to be cases or regulations, and, and these are in the trenches, Linda described. These are happening every single day, by the way every single day, all of this is happening, uh, uh, but it's not easy to research that. Uh, 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 and, and I'll come to that later, uh, uh, that that's you know, one of the reasons, but also to be frank, one of the reasons why, I love this quote, I'm gonna read it from you. Uh, uh, this is, in academic realms, meanwhile, it became received wisdom, at least among many heavily cited professors at elite law schools, Dan Esty, if you're still here from Yale, uh, uh, that environmental law is profoundly dysfunctional, largely because of its emphasis on rigid, ill-informed, and centralized uh, coercion. Uh, uh, there, and I take it that as your sort of, you know, received wisdom uh, uh, on uh, 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 that issue. And, and because of that, that means most academic people, a lot of law review articles that are cited, and you did a great job of that, are looking at what I think of as the first part of environmental law. Mm -hmm. And that is, how is it created? Those are the statutes. And, you know, how is it promulgated? Those are the regulations, but not how it's implemented. Well, largely because, frankly, most law professors don't know. Uh, 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 and you're an <laughs> exception because you did two things. First of all, you have some experience in a law firm, but second, you did something you don't see in law review articles. You went out and asked people uh, what they thought. And that's what this sets this apart. Now, frankly, the fact that you made them all anonymous uh, uh, out there uh, uh, left a little bit to be desired because I thought, well, I probably know some of that. And maybe I don't, maybe I don't agree. Maybe I don't like uh, what they said. And I think, you know, most of them have big egos, so they probably would have said, yeah, sure, uh, uh, you can use my name. And, and, but let's do it super long. IRB, right? Yep. My name, uh, 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 there. But I thought, you know, the beginning half of your law review article, which describes you know, the, the absence of knowledge uh, uh, by a lot of people in the academic world, by the way, not in the practice world. Most of my, I have a, you know, I'm the beverage diamond law firm that only does environmental law. They would be astonished uh, uh, to find out that everybody doesn't know we negotiate all the time mm -hmm. on every issue. They would be astonished. That's why we get hired 
is that so that we can do that. So they would find this discussion kind of strange uh, 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 there, but I get it, but I get it in terms of certainly the way you laid it out. And then you did a nice job of highlighting some of the statutes. Of course you start with CERCLA, Superfund. Of course you start there because there's a statute that's designed to settle. It's designed, it pushes you to settle uh, 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 there. And yet the implementation of that, uh, um, things like we call work decrees, where you do what is referred to as an RD, you know, remedial design, remedial action. The standard consent decree, which I helped develop when I was at Department of Justice has some things you can negotiate, some things you can't. Why do you have things you can't negotiate? In the, in the private world, we, we don't like any of that. We want to negotiate everything. But in the public world, you go, some of these things are in our best interest not to negotiate on every single case. We want commonality. And frankly, we don't want to spend the next two years negotiating things that we are not going to change uh, uh, there. So there's reasons not to negotiate some things. But what I'm told, remember in my thesis, the outset is we're negotiating everything. And it and it's re and I mean everything uh, uh, there. I want to I want to draw because I thought that was the the significant part uh, of your large view and what you're what you're offering and I and I want to comment. So you say implications. Uh, one of the implications was sort of wake up. What is it? The elite law professors from, <laughs> uh, from law schools to say, well, people are negotiating, and that means that the promulgation is guided by the implementation. That means you can't actually look at new source performance standards under the Clean Air Act without understanding how that is gonna apply in permits and how people actually negotiate that. You can't understand that without understanding how that works uh, 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 there. So maybe it guides other people to figure out the whole of environmental law is not just law and regulations. It is what we people do every single day. And by the way, particularly in enforcement, most of it is by states, not by federal government. Most of it is by states, so that's point number one uh, 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 there. But the other one was slippage. Slippage is this notion, this is notion that somehow uh, uh, there are lots of government people who don't have the foggiest idea what they're doing, they walk in and they get killed uh, uh, by people like me and my wife. <laughs> Frankly, I didn't see that. I mean, I, I, I'm in, you know, I spent a lot of life in public life, now in private life, I think we have a lot of good negotiators in, in our in our law firm. A lot of them came out of the government, frankly. But I, well, I thought I was at Department of Justice. I thought they had a lot of uh, uh, good negotiators there too. I would say be wary when we talk about slippage, uh, because if you come out of litigation or if you come out of a negotiation, if you really did well, uh, then you tell your company or you'll tell your client or you tell your agency, I really did a good job. Uh, uh, you know, I was really prepared. Look what I brought home. If it doesn't go so well, then you go, well, the other side was the pit. Uh, uh, you know, they just were not bad at all. They were prepared. They didn't know there were flexibility and we couldn't get them to do anything. So you have to be a little bit careful uh, uh, about slippage. And I'll tell you in that regard, you know, one uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, 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 story, which is essentially slippage. So now, you know, BP, uh, uh, we have th <laughs> three trials. We're in the Supreme Court multiple times uh, uh, that and we negotiate after a year, after a year of negotiating, and we come up with a $22 billion settlement, which when it was announced by the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch was announced as the largest of its type ever in the history, not just of environmental law, but of law in general. All right, so that's a setting. But before we did that, before we did that, we did public hearings in six different places uh, out there. I ran the one in DC. Now remember, $22 billion is a lot like there. Well, yes, in the public hearing, there were some people who said good things, but mostly they thought oh, there was ways that we could have been better. We could have gotten more money or we, we could have done more of our remedial work in areas that they cared about. And, and I'm confident they would say that was slippage. Uh, uh, you could have gotten more than you did uh, uh, there. So you have to be a little concerned as you hear people say, well, you could have done better uh, uh, because that's very often in the eye of the whole. All right, so now your top three, transparency. Transparency is a word, it's like a true false question on one of my tests, we're poor, right? We're, we're automatically <laughs> poor. We don't even know what it's about. All right, uh, we just know we're poor. But the notion that the government is gonna go out and say, here is my permit, or here is my consent decree. I just wanna let you know, there's, there's four or five provisions there that we're really open to negotiating. That's not the way it works. Uh, uh, it works like 
I've given you a good job. You ought to just sign your name right now. Uh, uh, that's what you ought to do. But then we negotiate. We negotiate all of uh, 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 that. So I, so the notion that there are, you know, manuals out there that talk about things in the practice, we all know that. We all know uh, that we're going to be negotiating all of that. Here's a problem, though. There isn't really a repository. Uh, uh, and, and I think you, you comment on that, and I'll say it quite openly. It would be good if there were NGOs or other people that would actually put in one place all the environmental impact statements or all of the permits of, you know, for stormwater, uh, 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 that would help. By the way, every law firm has one. We do, uh, mm -hmm. for sure, because we're drawing from our own expertise because you don't want to reinvent that. The one place that you miss, actually, is the Department of Justice. It actually has a repository of consent decrees because all the consent decrees going out for public comment are available to you. And those of us in private practice access it all the time. Why? Because it gives you some idea of what Department of Justice is going to use for you, your case uh, 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 there. But I, I, again, uh, uh, um, again, the world out there really knows you negotiate, but, but a repository stuff would help. How about effectiveness uh, uh, there? I, uh, again, at DOJ, we, we, we ran training. We, we ran courts for settlement issues. We had one whole block when I was there on alternative dispute resolution. So at some places, it happens all the time, but training is always good. But I don't want to let you off the hook or me in my uh, uh, teaching days or any of you who are professors off the hook because there's not a lot of discussion about whether or not you're teaching negotiation in law schools. I didn't get it. I got trial practice. I got all that. But actually, we do a lot more negotiating. We do trial practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I call myself a litigator, but really I'm a negotiator uh, uh, there. So I don't want to let law schools off the hook. Uh, 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 there of saying, yeah, if training is a good thing, if that's what an important part of our profession, if we're all doing it in private practice, it would help uh, uh, in negotiating. And then finally, your third point, which out of everything in your article, this challenged me the most. And it was, where does equity fit uh, in negotiations? And, and equity, by that, I really mean, you know, disadvantaged communities, environmental justice, I'm a big promoter of environmental justice, but where does that fit? Uh, uh, because when you're negotiating a permit, you're, you have a client and you're trying to make that work. If you're the government, you're trying to figure out how do I actually keep my water quality standards? How actually do I get, you know, BAT? How do I do those things? So it's going to survive anybody else challenging uh, of that. And you're not always thinking about uh, uh, environmental justice or the role of equity. But, but I found that challenging and good. Let me tell you two places where I think it, it works, one in particular. When I first started out at Department of Justice, we did our consent decrees. Uh, it was largely the result uh, of your finding liable, and then you're seeking a penalty, sometimes pretty massive, and you're also seeking injunctive relief to make sure it doesn't happen again. That has evolved. That has evolved. So when I did Volkswagen, as probably most of you know, particularly those of you who have Volkswagen cars, uh, uh, we created a mitigation fund. We created a fund that looked at sulfur dioxide and NOx across the United States, how much excess came out because of Dieselgate, uh, and then divided that among the states so that you could do projects. That's mitigation. It's also a way that communities can be involved because they can affect that. They can argue about what that, and that's happening more, but you ought to keep your eye on it. And then this is not a political statement, just a true statement that during the Trump administration, they did away with supplemental environmental projects. It's back now. That's another way of involving uh, 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 the community. I would like, final point, I would like to have had more enforcement. You did two or three pages on enforcement, um, but that is really the heart of negotiation. Uh, and another place I would like to see a study is at Department of Justice, many states too, but DOJ by policy, before they bring an enforcement case, uh, they send a letter that says, welcome to the dance, we're going to sue you. Uh, uh, here's a chance to settle. And, and it'd be nice to have some academic review of how what happens with those letters? How many do they blow off? How many do you actually have settlements? What do those settlements look like? Uh, um, but it does occur. It, it does occur all the time uh, uh, there. And, and then when there is a settlement, uh, they have notice and comment. You know, and also that notice and comment is another way for third parties to be involved, communities to be involved, because once they have that comment, they actually take that to the judge before they ask the judge to enter the consent decree. I thought it was good. I liked it. I thought part of what was challenging uh, uh, there, and I particularly appreciate uh, uh, that you went out and got real world input. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Wonderful. And, you know, I, I heard a lot of references to the state, yeah. Ben, yes. and it all comes down to the state. So. It does. It does. So, uh, <laughs> where's the camera? <laughs> You're on. I'm back there. Right. Okay. The, um, this is the uh, magic hat of the Environmental Council of the States. And if you wear this hat, when it comes to negotiation, you are invincible. <laughs> what, what the audience doesn't know is that the panelists negotiated how much time we would have in our sequencing. <laughs> Vicki and I lost. We follow John Cruz. Yeah. And, and I really only have about five minutes worth that I just want to emphasize. But the most important point, uh, other than stating the obvious here, that it's a great article, Dave, and that black letter law is implemented in countless shades of gray. Uh, more than just 50, by the way, and that interpretation and negotiation are at every single step of the way. And so the article does a great job laying out some of the examples from developing conservation plans, cleanup plans, standards, permits, enforcement, monitoring, community engagement, uh, and then highlight some areas uh, as well for possible improvement, which John just did a nice job summarizing some of those, as did Carl. Uh, my bottom line message to you all is that uh, when it comes to environmental law, states are the nation's implementation stations. And every aspect of implementation involves some human experience, judgment, and you can call it negotiation. Let's embrace that. And uh, Dave, uh, you you dig deep on the obvious to come in, in with a, a lot of examples that are useful to everyone, uh, particularly young lawyers, but also those who have been in the trenches. Uh, I said states are the, uh, na the nation's implementation stations because States have, you know, if you look at the federal environmental laws, 50 of the states have received EPA delegation for uh, implementation of most of the clean air standards. 49 states have primacy to implement and enforce Safe Drinking Water Act uh, programs for public water systems. 48 states have prim primary authorization to implement and enforce the RICRA hazardous waste program. 47 states are authorized to carry out the Clean Water Act, NIPTES permitting and enforcement programs. And so uh, when you were going through some of the examples, uh, I think you really get the nail on the head when you, you mentioned, well, for, in, for instance, under the Federal Clean Water Act implementation, which is done by the states primarily in terms of the permits and enforcement. Um, you, where we are now, where a lot of the negotiation occurs, it's, it's not a dark art. It's an art and a science, and you're shining a light on it. it it's in the water quality-based world, the water quality-based effluent limits, the taking into account the impaired water bodies and what beyond the technology-based control. That does require art. It requires science and, and having a basis in law. It's litigated often, but that's a good example of how Negotiation and and, and judgment and experience are important. One of the most important reasons for negotiation is to come up with creative solutions. That is really the key, I think. I one of the best examples you were you were disparaging uh, Regnag, an informal. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not championing it. I'm just going to say that <laughs> I just wanted your attention. Um, the uh, one of the best examples I can think of. Uh, was the 1994 combined sewer overflow policy for the nation. Under This is another a Clean Water Act example where uh, this isn't spelled out in the law itself. Uh, Congress needed to act, but they weren't going to. The regs weren't exactly clear. And the question was, how do those hundreds and hundreds of communities that have combined stormwater and wastewater systems deal with those overflows? What are the legal and enforcement consequences? And the EPA and the states worked to put out together a, a policy that was of all about negotiation and creative solutions with minimum controls and long-term control plans. 
And it was received so well that eventually Congress enacted it by basically saying, carrying out the Clean Water Act, you must conform to the 1994 Combined Sewer Overflow Control Policy. But there are great examples. Carl, you mentioned uh, uh, water quality certifications, the 50, you know, reauthorizing, uh, renewing uh, hydro uh, permits for uh, dams. And uh, that involves a lot of negotiation and trying to interpret what are uh, water quality requirements um, uh, for a state and how you put those into that FERC license. Um, here, I, I just want to touch on um, the three real quickly. Uh, which I think is is wise and smart for you to highlight transparency, effectiveness, equity. On the transparency front, uh, easier said than done. Uh, I wouldn't say this publicly because it, it'll be misinterpreted. But sometimes we did this public. I know, but uh, <laughs> a friend, okay. A friend of mine says transparency <laughs> can be overrated. Right. And I'm just saying that if you, you don't, one thing you don't want to do is violate a confidentiality agreement or a non disclosure agreement. And sometimes you don't want to negotiate in the media, in the press. Uh, so there's a time and place for everything, but the more uh, the public knows about what was negotiated and the more affected, uh, impacted citizens or advocacy groups know that you're going through a negotiation process that can help lead to a more creative solution. But transparency is important and, and uh, posting what you're doing generally, but re respecting the confidentiality of making some decisions that often involve a lot of politicians who could throw everything awry. So that's important. And on the effectiveness, using the, the powerful tools of information uh, these days, will only increase the ability of a governmental agency, particularly at the state level, who are they're so strapped for resources to make smarter decisions and, and negotiate for, for bigger, better um, improvements. And uh, I would also say on the uh, equity point, I was working on Capitol Hill in 1986 when CERCLA was reauthorized. And I was really amazed by this innovative approach I saw included where the EPA would, for the first time, be providing up to $50,000 for technical assistance right. grants. Knowledge is power, but access to knowledge is not so easy. And Dave, you certainly lay that out, that there are barriers to better engagement of advocacy groups, communities, EJ community groups, uh, so that message from the technical assistance uh, grants of the CERCLA to try to increase awareness and the ability of communities to actually engage meaningfully in the development of remediation cleanup plans at Superfund sites is certainly being used a lot now. Um, I just uh, would say the last thing is, uh, for instance, today, well, let me ask, I will give this hat to any law school student who can tell me uh, or who can come the closest to answering what are Tic Tacs? Mm. Hint, it's not just a breath mint. <laughs> T-A-C-S, but I forget what it stands for. That's close enough. Uh, thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers, $160 million. 10 million going out to 16 community <laughs> assistance centers. Boy, that, that looks really good. <laughs> to increase the ability of EJ communities to actually engage in this in the app applying for federal assistance, to track to manage the grants, to track the grants, to have public listening sessions and translate that knowledge to permit writers and decision makers. It's an example of where the tag, the Superfund tag program went, and it's about negotiation and providing technical assistance. State agencies need more funding and technical assistance, having centers of excellence within state agencies on alternative dispute resolution and negotiation would go a really long way. And, and, and I think you're planning a seat for more of that through your article. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I want to start by thanking Michael and all of the students at Vanderbilt who are kind of modeling uh, this very concept, and that is um, really searching for new ideas, challenging kind of our priors, and fostering dialogue. We need more and more of that, so thank you all for all that you do and, um, and showing up here and creating the, the space for this discussion. It's hugely, hugely important. Um, thank you to Professor Owen for his meditation on environmental law and a pluralistic society. Um, it is about some core values. It is about some dialogue and it is far more, right? Because you know one of the foundations that we depend upon to have a functioning environmental law is we have to have some you know reliable, predictable sort of statements um, that are very normative that establish kind of this framework that we can all depend upon and work within um, and really be reflective of, of our values, um, our commitment as a society to clean air, clean water, and to equity and justice. Um, and so we, we need that. We need that stability, that framework, and that way to be expressed. And within that, there's been an enormous amount of innovation. You can call it negotiation. You can call it discussion. You can call it dialogue. What it really comes down to is people deciding to show up as problem solvers, people deciding to show up within that framework and a commitment to work together, to listen to each other, to do what the Vanderbilt students are doing here, and that is create the space for dialogue on difficult issues. We need more and more of that, and that has been really the success and the homework. That duality in its most broad, expansive form has been really the success of environmental law um, in American society. We um, need more of that. Um, we have huge challenges in you know, trying to tackle the climate crisis and trying to advance equity in a way that is meaningful and sustained. And so we need you know, more tools. We need more people in the conversation, more innovation, more ways to try to figure this out together. And um, I know, and I think, you know, Professor Owen has given us a really important framework to think about that and how to build from that. Um, it is changing right now before our very eyes. So we are seeing kind of a sweeping, changing landscape in environmental law. You are in it. You're talking about <laughs> tax. There are historic investments unleashed by the Inflation Reduction Act that fundamentally change sort of the whole conversation and the possibilities of where environmental law can take us. So we are seeing you know, new manufacturing being built all across our country as part of the transition to clean energy. You're seeing it in Tennessee and Kentucky and Texas and Ohio and Michigan and Nevada and Arizona and much more. Thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, billions and billions and billions of dollars. How we do that really matters. As lawyers, how we show up in those conversations, are we doing that in a way that creates benefits for people's lives or runs roughshod over people's communities? Hugely important. We can't get to net zero unless we're showing up in a way that is creating benefits for people's lives. You're seeing right now, you know, historic investments in rural um, energy that we, you know, the earlier um, panel discussed, hugely important. We have to bring everyone along, no communities left behind as part of this big, big grants that are happening. Yesterday, EPA announced a new massive sort of grant um, to try to direct resources and unlock clean energy and opportunity in communities all across our country. You know, these, this is how environmental law is changing within this framework that Professor Owen laid out before our very eyes. We have new technologies from sensors to satellites that enable all sorts of possibilities in terms of accountability and progress and changing the conversation. As law students, as legal practitioners, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to show up as a problem solver. It's an opportunity to show up and being innovative and part of the solution. You can have both. You can do that in a way that is committed to the foundations of environmental law, and you can do that in a way that is listening and learning from others and meeting them where they're at and trying to make important progress. I wanna to just touch on some of the really key concerns that you raised about equity and transparency and just share a couple of examples that have just emerged in the last few months that people are just inventing to try to address this and invite more. So the Saban Center has just launched a really terrific platform where they're trying to collect all of these community benefit agreements 
right? Because one of the key issues that Professor Owen highlighted is that communities need more information to understand, look, if someone's showing up in my neighborhood with a big storage project, what does that look like? What's, how do I protect myself? And so you can get on the Saving Center website and you can check out and see what other communities have done to ensure that they benefit from a large, you know, scale storage project showing up in their neighborhood. You know, what did that developer provide in terms of, you know, um, emergency preparedness? What did that developer provide in terms of compensation on property values? What did that developer provide in terms of, you know, sustained engagement with the community? We need more of that, but that's one way that people are inventing ways to provide greater transparency and greater equity. Another way, um, I have some colleagues um, at Environmental Defense Fund who partnered with Blacks and Green to create a whole new initiative called Community Voices and Energy, I invite you to check it out. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that the article doesn't spend as much time on that's really, really important right now is what happens in our Public Utilities Commission. And that is a place where communities have not been part of the dialogue. So community voices and energy is all about trying to knock down those barriers and try to bring community voices into the conversation. This is where environmental law, this is where investments kind of meet the rubber meets the road in addition to the states where you know capital gets translated into will it have benefits for people's lives or will it not have benefits for people's lives? And so in Illinois, a few months ago, um, the four largest gas utilities in Illinois showed up before the Illinois Commerce Commission and said, we want $872 million of investments in new gas infrastructure. And Community Voice and Energy came into that proceeding and shared their perspective, which is they would like that, that investment to be clean. And they want to make sure that it doesn't saddle communities with higher costs. They wanna be part of the conversation and they provided expert testimony. Check it out, Community Voices and Energy. You can see their expert testimony and share it and socialize it. We want to grow it, and but that's an important way where people are just inventing. How do you knock down some of those barriers to, to, trend, you know, to ensure greater transparency and equity? And you know, don't let there be any limits on your imagination. Just one example of something just transformative that happened within this architecture, this duality of, you know, a framework of rigorous environmental law anchored in core values and inventiveness and dialogue is an agreement that California reached with a number of major auto manufacturers in the last administration when there was a, a really an unprecedented attack on California's longstanding authority to establish emission standards for motor vehicles hugely important for California to be able to provide healthier lives for millions, 40 million people. Hugely important for California to be able to attack and address the climate crisis. Hugely important for the innovation happening in California on all of these fronts. And so they negotiated a voluntary and enforceable accountable agreement with a number of major auto manufacturers that said, notwithstanding whatever happens in all of this uncertainty that's being created, we have a path forward. We're committed to progress, to climate progress, to public health protections. We are going to move forward together. That's people inventing and creating within the core framework of environmental law. Don't let there be any limitations on what you think is possible. Anything is possible. A couple of weeks ago, Stellantis Chrysler said, we want in on that. We want to be part of that agreement. So check that out. And they said, we want to be part of that through 2030 because we, we're committed to what we call a new initiative at Chrysler Stellantis called, you know, dare boldly, dare forward. And so off they go committing to move forward in a big, bold way. There are some dark clouds on the horizon and the darkest clouds on the horizon are the US Supreme Court and the hostility that the US Supreme Court has to environmental law. We have this framework that we have depended upon in American society for decades that has been predictable and stable. And within that, people have invented and solved problems. And thank you to Professor Owen for knocking down sort of the, the myths that we don't, we do. People do it all the time. They show up to solve problems and to improve lives. The United States Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a uh, major set of cases in January. And 
in you know, her presentation to the Supreme Court, Solicitor General Elizabeth Kuloger said, um, if the court headed down this pathway of changing some of the core doctrines of administrative law, it would be a shock to our legal system, a shock to our, she is a very understated person. She called it a potential shock to our legal system. And then Justice Amy Coney Barrett said during the course of that oral argument, if the court heads in this direction, it would unleash a flood of litigation. So we have to continue to work to help try to protect the core framework and foundations of environmental law, to find ways to solve problems and to recognize that there are serious threats to the very sort of foundations that a lot of enormous and important progress has depended upon. Thank you. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking, road show to all law schools around the country and you redo this because I mean, it. no, I mean, it, it really is so interesting and, and, and important and inspirational. And Vicki, something that just to add to what you said, because I think it's so important is that not only did California enter into those agreements with private automakers, but they agreed to apply those standards nationwide. Yes, they did. Right? And yes, so, did. so I've been yes, calling them did. de facto national yes, standards. They did. They've yes. effectively... Yes insulated yes. that part of the industry it's going to help the industry they'll have consistency and it will basically stability. exactly so yep. the swinging pendulum administrations and the supreme court just just got by that. yes sure did. private governance That's what it is. <laughs> um we want to give the professor a chance to respond so what? i was going to say since we haven't had much time for audience questions let's skip that smart Okay. Right, let's just go. Let's go. That's straight. a generous move on your part. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will go in person questions, and then we have some online as well. Well, now you got a question. The audience is going to take your question. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle. Okay. Well. Okay, Kyle. I'm a student, so I feel like as an L bar for you can always. Do. I guess my question is: it was alluded to in a couple of the comments, and maybe this gives you a chance to respond, Professor Owen. But thinking in like a co sort of framework with an economist where it's like we can negotiate away all of our problems and we don't need private law except to sort of allocate initial like distributions of rights. If we are negotiating so much of environmental law, what does environmental law do? I mean, assess the initial positions for the negotiation. I think I think that's the answer. I mean, so much of what we do is we negotiate where a developer essentially says, a developer of any number of types of projects says if uh if i give you these increased environmental benefits will you give me a more streamlined procedural path unless there are procedural burdens that are threatened that's not an appealing negotiation position for the developer so law matters there be by requiring procedure um, and then similarly there because not everything is negotiable there are parameters um, and so Again, the, the, the law, whether it's the Endangered Species Act or the Clean Water Act, I think it puts boundaries on the, the positions within the negotiation that are tenable. So it is not just a world of sort of completely random private ordering. Environmental law puts sometimes a thumb on the scales and sometimes it takes away the scales um, and just says this is what's going to happen. And I think both of those roles are very important. Does anyone else want to jump on that? Yeah, I would just add that it's a framework that is um, anchored in law and science and strong normative um, values that reflect kind of, a, you know, the consensus of many, many you know, aspects of society. So having that to kind of guide us as we move forward and try to tackle big problems is hugely important. And it's real and it's articulated. And um and within that, and that's why I think the shifts within the Supreme Court are so potentially destabilizing because um, what it does is it invites litigation instead of conversation. It invites, it's going to potentially invite a huge, huge change in kind of the longstanding you know, effort for people to kind of roll up their sleeves and try to figure out and solve problems and really instead you know, reward and invite um, just extensive litigation. And that's there's already too much, and and so I think we'll see potentially even more. Michael, do you want oh, to yeah. so question? We've talked a lot today about transparency, and so I'm just curious from your perspectives as either former regulators or as parties negotiating across from agencies, I guess, do you believe that increasing transparency on the agency side would disadvantage those agencies negotiating across from their counterparties who are not required to disclose their negotiating positions? Can I just initially say, when we're talking about increasing transparency, 
one way of saying one way of doing that is to focus very specifically on a particular negotiation and say you know both sides you've got to disclose your positions there are laws that do that like unions in california that are negotiating with school boards have to disclose their negotiating positions um they ignore that requirement all the time. Um, but they're supposed to. Um, so that's one option. What I'm thinking about here is much more about just basic transparency about what's negotiable and what's not, mm -hmm. so that you so that you don't have to be John Cruden to know. Um, like you're like everybody knows this, but you're a partner at Beverage and Diamond and you're former head of, of ENRD. So you, there's a lot of stuff that you know and it is <laughs> I think received wisdom in, in or not received wisdom, which is very commonly known in your world. Um, that is that is not known outside it. It is not easy to, to discover unless somebody has access to a mentor like you. Um, and so that's that's a very different kind of transparency. And that's that's what I was almost more trying to emphasize yes. here. And I would add to that and separate the notion of finding out the result of the negotiation, find out what that last permit looked like versus talking about the back and forth. The back and forth, we often say that you can't negotiate in a fishbowl. Uh, uh, meaning that there's too many forces out there. And so there's reasons why the, the negotiation back and forth is confidential. There's a reason why that occurs. And there's a lot of confidential business information that you don't want public because it disadvantages that company. That's a different issue than, than publicizing and understanding the results of all of them, which I think you can uh, gain from. And we in practice, we do all the time. Uh, uh, there. In justice, we never started out with a blank piece of paper. We started out with the last consent decree of that yeah. particular process. Mm -hmm. We're negotiating. We start out with other permits that have impacted, that have gone through the process. It doesn't end it, but it's a good starting point uh, out there. So I took your admonition for transparency to really talk about what is negotiable and then what's the endpoint of that negotiation. Yeah. Right. I, I just wanted to chime in on, from a state perspective not just Maryland and Arizona, where I was the head of the two different agencies, but all of the states recognize, you asked the question, you know, can a state be, agency be disadvantaged if it does, if there's too much transparency? You can also say, won't the state agency be disadvantaged if there isn't enough transparency? Because uh, the public policy makers in the state, the community, uh, the advocates of, uh, can really undermine a state uh, agency's ability to negotiate effectively and increase equity if the state is not trusted because they're not disclosing these opportunities of when can there be negotiation, how much negotiate. I mean, I, I think it's, it's a great area for improvement. It's just that we do have to be careful as a state agency sometimes on what you disclose when, but inviting more input and also uh, having the catalog or library of, of supplemental environmental projects. Uh, that's a great example of uh, increasing equity and opportunities beyond just your standard cookie cutter settlement agreements or penalties to the state uh, yeah. coffers. Yeah. Plus, plus one with John and Ben, and I just pulling on the thread from the earlier panel, the, um, you know, we have to build trust. We have huge challenges in addressing climate change and, and environmental injustices. And to get to net zero where we need to get, we can't do it by breaching trust. We have to find solutions that benefit people's lives, right? That lift everyone up um, and that, you know, are anchored in trust and conversation. And we have to do that at great with great intensity and focus and speed and skip. And we can do all of that um, if people, I think, show up um, yeah. in good faith and, and well-meaning. And to John's point, like if you look at the Sabin Center like compilation of uh, community benefit agreements, it is not going to be necessarily the answer for your community, but it sure does help to know kind of where other communities, you know, landed and how they solve these problems. It's you know one of many ways that we can all work together to foster you know both transparency and equity. And before we leave this, I want to leave just one other issue, and that is, it used to be ten years ago that we really relied on national press uh, to put out mm -hmm. a lot of the information, mm -hmm. a lot of the stories yeah. that were there. When I was at ELI, we did a study and found out that in the national press, the ones we really care about, there was only six full time. Uh, environmental law reporters, and it's not at Washington Post, and it's not at New York Times, yeah. it's not LA Times. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we have lost some of that, 
is really an important loss of transparency. It's a loss of education mm -hmm. uh, 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 there. And that's just one other Oversight. challenge for you, David, right. is to somehow take into account that we don't have things that we right. used to have in terms of uh, right. getting the word out. And, and, you know, I took note of your saying socialize it, mm -hmm. which has a whole new meaning on socialization sure. or socializing, right? But that's what we're looking at now in, in mm -hmm. instead. Did we have a... Um, yes, yes. In terms of equity, um, you know, you mentioned that um, who had the privilege to come to these long ballrooms in the middle of mm -hmm. the day? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what are your recommendations for environmental justice for the most vulnerable communities to actually gain access to this knowledge? and have a seat at the table yeah. when it comes to utilizing funds for mm -hmm. tax and other programs. And, you know, when you said that, I thought about, because we both litigated mm -hmm. uh, those cases, and I remember being in those ballrooms in Philadelphia, and there'd be the truck driver that showed up, or the guy, you know, mm -hmm. who, who was actually, you know, working at the site in overalls, right? Mm -hmm. And it was this, like, stark contrast to mm -hmm. all of these Uber educated lawyers, you know, in, in their in their suits and, and you can see how what the norm was in that room and how uncomfortable it felt. And you can imagine how this, you know, the, the public accessibility is community benefit agreements, for example, is a good starting place. If you show up at that meeting um, easily able right. to obtain the last three or four agreements, it's a lot easier to come to the table and right. say, we need something at least this How do you get there so during the work yeah. day? You yeah. Know? Can I just hold it? Do you want the office to speak? Yeah. I'm going to have a lot of ideas <laughs> So I, I, I'll start answering it by, so that, that quote came from a conversation with, I can't reveal my sources, but everybody at this table knows um, the attorney that I was talking to there, um, even though you'll now have to guess who it is. Um, and the conversation kept going and we kept talking about, okay, what do you do about it? And, you know, part of what he was saying is, look, like it doesn't have to be the middle of the day. It could be the evening. You could have childcare at the site so that people can bring their kids. Um, Better yet, you can figure out where the community that you want to reach is reachable right. and you go find them there. So, okay, it's a Latinx community. You go find them on Saturday when they're watching their kids' soccer games because the whole community gathers for that. Um, and then that could like, backfire. <laughs> Actually, I'm a community right. organizer that works in this community that does the evenings and the weekends. How do you get lawyers and regulators on the weekends mm -hmm. and the evening? Mm -hmm. I, well, I think in this case, he was saying, I am the lawyer, so if I'm, you know, I'll show up and yeah, then yeah. I'm there. It's, yeah. it's on me to okay. make mm -hmm. sure that I'm mm -hmm. coming at you. So I think the, I'll throw a few, a few other things out. One other thing that came out quite a bit in the conversations was that sometimes it's not so much access to legal expertise as to engineering and or on the consulting side. Mm -hmm. And so another thing that would be, this is not something we just wave our hands and do, but something that would be very helpful is to build a little bit more of a pro bono culture Mm -hmm. Among yeah, environmental probably. consulting firms, engineering firms, because exactly. they have really a lot of value to add. And, and a lot of the decision making processes don't really involve lawyers um, or minimally involve lawyers. It's really it's it's the consultants who are making the decisions. Um, and then the last thing I do think you know, this is the least original idea in the world, but it's still a good idea. Intervener funding really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, And I would just plus one on all of that. And um, the really unlocking the resources for communities under under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, one of the um, initiatives that we pursued and many others have pursued is um, we have a, a, a separate initiative from Environmental Defense Fund called the Frontline Resource Institute. And what it is doing is providing grants, uh, writing support to communities. And um, because just having the, the support to you know, request grants and the funding so that we're really doing the very best we can to unlock the full potential and access to in the most equitable, equitable way to those, to those environmental justice um, investments. And so one of many ways, and, and, and I think lots, of, lots more to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that Dave started out with was talking about CERCLA. In my world, there's a plethora of lawyers and he's coming to these things and there was a New York uh, uh, a cartoon of a couple of years ago where one of the clients is standing up in this room full of lawyers and saying, did anybody lose their lawyer? Because I seem to have two. <laughs> <laughs> so the only thing that can happen, uh, I've been looking for an opportunity to mention this, is that this EOI just Thank today you. is releasing a toolkit for incorporating plant-based protein measures in municipal climate action plans, but it's a 
it's a model. The idea, I think NGOs don't do enough of producing model statutes and so forth on the environmental side. I think a lot of the anti-environmental movements are really good at model yeah. legislation, et cetera. Environmental groups have to focus on the perfect and they want just the perfect. But these kind of model agreements where you get to choose among different good things point. makes it really yeah. easy for people when you do have the staff necessary to come in and make a difference. Yeah. And what, oh, uh, uh, Carl. I just wanted to follow on that because I, I think you hit on a really important point it goes back to Vicky's opening sentence. The environmental groups focus on the perfect, but we live in a pluralistic society with multiple values. And we are increasingly polarized and we're not able or unwilling to compromise the perfect for the good or the progressive. And I think that we really need to come back to that as an approach. Mm -hmm. And I think we also need to be thinking about rough justice because one person's justice is going to be somebody else's mm -hmm. injustice mm -hmm. in some way. So we really need to be thinking about trying to optimize for multiple perspectives. And I, th I think you're, you're coming about living in a pluralistic society. We forget that. We want to live in a world that is as we see it and mm -hmm. only as we see it. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a quick question before um, we wrap up? So we've actually been doing a lot of work in, in the public involvement, meaningful public involvement space, um, particularly at the local level. And one of the distinctions that is made in, um, I, I would say the public administration literature maybe, is between thick engagement and thin engagement, right? So thick engagement being like participatory budgeting where you're engaging on an ongoing and regular basis. and I'm just curious if you have thoughts on that. I mean, it requires obviously funding, you know, to support people's participation. But when you're talking about negotiation, it, it can't really just be this one-off meeting where you get some input. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it needs to be more ongoing engagement. Mm -hmm. So I just was wondering if you had any more thoughts on that. So I, I, I'm going to disagree somewhat with the last thing that you said. And the reason I, I will disagree is that part of my interest in this paper was at looking at the lower profile routine grind of permitting mm -hmm. and of environmental decision making. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands of decisions being made and there's no way NGOs can staff True. not just thick yeah. engagement, but even thin engagement True. on most of them. Yeah. For the system to work as it should, we actually have to have a system that works mm -hmm. when you've just got a bilateral negotiation with the regulator mm -hmm. and the permit applicant and the environmental groups aren't even involved. And that's not because, you know, it would be better if they were, but they just don't have the resources. So I think it's, I think it's a really difficult issue because obviously thick engagement is preferable. And yet at the mm -hmm. same time, in mm -hmm. talking to, I mean, this came mm -hmm. through in talking to some of the environmental groups I've talked to for this, they're yeah. like, we are so sick of thick engagement. We're so sick of it because we just don't have the resources to staff it. And then everybody yells at us for not being there every in the weekly meeting and saying, oh, you walked away from the table and it's all your fault. Why are you complaining? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. Oh, and I, I'm not saying yeah. I think there's a time for thin engagement. I mean, including yeah. surveys in some cases, right? Like sometimes right. any input is, is useful. Yeah. But in the kind of, you know, negotiations John was working on that just a huge magnitude, it strikes me that. And I was just yeah. curious if there if you'd come across any particularly creative ways of funding and support that kind of participation from people who are already overburdened and, you know, so if I'm working two jobs and have kids and, you know. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think some of the list of things we talked about before is works there. The really hard challenge is, I think, how do you support effective thin engagement? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't have great ideas there, yeah. but yeah. I think it's an important question. Yeah. Maybe the question is for the philanthropic community. I mean, ultimately, there's yeah. a huge yeah. amount of money flowing into this area. Maybe yeah. some kind of yeah. thin engagement yeah, that's an interesting uh, element to EDF or another yeah. group or a whole entity in and of itself. And that happens in certain states. Okay. Uh, it, that definitely happens in certain states. It, it's a, you know, smart engagement over thick engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, um, I think we will wrap up by thank you, our wonderful panel. And I want to say stay after we clap because Jacqueline is going to just give us some closing remarks. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Knoll, and I've had the pleasure of serving as the executive editor of LPAR this last year. And it's just been an incredible two years with these other nine 3Ls. And I'm so sad that it's, that it's all ending. But 
Thank you all so much for being here today in person and online. It has just been such an engaging audience, so thank you. And I just want to take a moment and thank all of the hands that have gone into making today happen. So first, thank you to all of our speakers, authors, panelists, your time commitment and just bringing such insight into these articles has just been phenomenal. Um, thank you ELI for hosting us and just being an incredible partner through the years. Thank you, Tori, for everything that you've done. <laughs> it's wonderful to finally put uh, the face to the name over the past two years. So thank you for your work. Um, of course, this connection to ELI would not be possible without our professors. Thank you for everything that you've done for us and yeah. giving us such a non-traditional journal experience. I mean, <laughs> this isn't exactly like the blue booking exercises you think of like in a law school journal. So thank you for this opportunity. A lot of students had their hands in today. Thank you, Kerrigan English, our symposium editor, for making everything go so smoothly today. It's just been wonderful. Um, a recording of the entire conference will be uploaded later along with all of the slides. So you can access them if you are only here for some of the panels, you're able to rewatch it. Um, you can look forward to reading the condensed version of all of the articles we've discussed today in the August edition of the Environmental Law Reporter. And finally, stick around for a reception right after this. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.